Sorry, boy. But his captain's got to teach his men what happens to those while crossing. Captain's got to teach stuff. <laughs> Good morning from the Bat Cave. Um, we're just going to look at this guy's face for a minute. A long minute. Because this dude just got on my channel. And for those of you who are critical of the fact that I delete comments on my channel, just so you know, when whenever I delete somebody, 100% of the time, I try to I try to reason with them first. If they prove themselves to be unreasonable, if they prove themselves to be unwilling to listen to reason, they're gone. I'm not going to. I don't have you know any kind of um, obligation to to suffer people who say stupid things or rude things or troll or whatever, and then want to do stuff like, oh, you can't debate because you won't leave my comments up where I'm just being a d bag over and over and over again. And this guy, Tom, was one of those people. So. Um, the reason I'm kind of using this clickbait title on top five preterist fails is because these, I don't know what it was about this video that clicked the algorithm. Again, this is just a passing thing. I am not that interested in preterism. I am not that interested in sorting it out. It is an irrelevant position that was invented in 1875. I've shown you guys the book by J. Stuart Russell. It is not a smart position. It is not a scholarly position. What it is is, guys, this this is what this is what the Calvinist tradition is going to do. They're they're going to write a 800 page book so that they can put in one lie in that book. That's just an outright lie, and it's a really stupid argument. But by the time you get to it, you're 180 pages into a really thick book that's quoted 800 things that you agree with and 9,000 things that are irrelevant to the point they're trying to make. Okay. That's how they do it. And so they'll string 50 verses together. This, this, I, I've read a Herman Babbing Systematic Theology. This is what they do. They'll string 50 proof texts together, and you go research those proof texts, and you find out like uh, a third of them aren't even talking about the subject you're talking about, and five of them definitely support my position, and you just string them together and throw them at you. And that's what they do. They want to bury you in information so that um, you, you, you ignore your own common sense. You read the Bible and then you let them gaslight you into thinking it means the opposite of what it says, okay? And this is what the, this guy's gonna do here. So he actually, he sent this video to me, okay? Basically said, I'm ignorant of the Greek and I need to educate myself by his video. So we're gonna go through his video and just show you some things in it that are very stupid. Now, the things that he's gonna say in this video that I agree with, they're all accusations of things that pre-trib dispensationalists do, okay? Pre-trib dispensationalists engage in debt, date setting. They say the fig tree relates to Israel. They're going to say a bunch of stuff in here that he's going to call as, as false, and I agree with him on. Okay, here's the problem: I'm not a dispy. Okay, I wrote my Revelation book to tell you guys everybody is getting forced into these two stupid ideas. One is amillennial preterism, and the other is dispensationalism, and they're both stupid ideas. And then the one that's emerging in the middle, uh, pre-wrath, is dangerous. So. I wrote my book to show you my position, which is mid-trib futurism, which is the original position of the oldest writers in the church, the oldest commenters on Daniel, the oldest commenters on Matthew 24, the oldest commenters on the book of Revelation. Okay. Now, I've gone over this in uh, numerous videos, and I have a whole playlist on mid-trib proofs and eschatology and stuff like that, and if you guys going to want to go watch that, watch it, okay? My videos are not here for you guys to get like a one proof text or a one liner to throw at these people, okay? These people are never going to be satisfied with a one liner because what what they do is they spend a hundred years proving, trying to disprove the 800 arguments that prove their position false. And they'll never stop, they'll never stop working at it, okay? They literally can ha butt up against 50,000 verses that say the opposite of what they're saying, and they're just going to come up with arguments, and if they got to go to the original Greek, or if they have to go to Judaism, or they have to go to the Old Testament, or they have to go to church history, they're going to go wherever they need to go to find the argument that makes negates the meaning of that passage, and that's what this guy's going to do here, okay? So I'm going to walk through his video with you, and again, I'm not going to watch the whole thing with you. I'm just going to point the, the key points of what he says to show you that this guy is just, his real reason for not liking the futurist position is because he got scared of the uh, the um, movie um, Thief of the Night as a kid. 
And so based on that and then based on the false predictions of dispensationalists, he's going to fall into the preterist camp. And he's going to put himself out here as a Greek expert. But when he get, got on my channel to try to correct me, he actually like completely misquoted. He, he used the Greek words for um, these things and said, that's this generation. And when I called him on it, I said, is that deliberate deception or are you uh, just, did you make a mistake? And he just like quickly like brushed off the fact he, he did admit making a mistake, but then just ignored the fact that he made it and just kept going on and on about how ignorant I am. And I'm like, uh, you just quoted you like you're you're claiming to be an expert in Greek. I'm claiming no expertise in Greek, and you just mistook the words these things for this generation, and then copied it and pasted it into my thing. And it seemed like he did it deliberately to try to, um, it was actually part of his argument that the word haute or otus isn't, isn't used in relation to Matthew 24 when it actually is, okay? Now, he makes this comment and, and 10 comments later, I've told him, hey, listen, I've already made a correction video on the point that I made, okay? I already pinned another guy's comment who made the point you're making. I corrected myself and made a correction video. Why don't you go watch that video? And then I said, why don't you go watch, look at this information so you can see that your position is from 1875 and mine is from 175, okay? And he wouldn't look at any of it. He wouldn't try to reason with me. He just kept being a douchebag and just basically saying, you're so ignorant in Greek. Nobody should trust anything you're saying. Nobody should listen to anything you're saying. You don't know Greek. I know Greek, okay? So I'm going to show you how well this guy knows Greek. And this is just a typical Calvinist. This is how they think, okay? And this is how they reason to you. I've met hundreds of them. They're, they, they, they come off as being really smart because they're going to tell you a bunch of irrelevant information that has nothing to do with the point, okay? That's what they do is they drown you in irrelevant information so you miss the part where they're deceiving you from the common sense information, okay? And so this guy is literally bringing up over and over again that that's the subject and the object and the feminine and the masculine. And I'm just like, what does that have to do with the point I'm making? The point that I'm making is about the context of usage and the preponderance of usage. And I show my source, source material and I show my rationale. By the end of this, he's saying, chat GPT doesn't know anything about ancient Greek and that uh, it only uses modern Greek, which is an absolute falsehood. You Literally, it's trained on just tons and tons of Greek manuscripts that are free on the internet, and that's why it gets to train on them, okay? It's not training on modern Greek. It's training on ancient Greek. It's training on all the classics that have been interpreted in all the languages because they're so classical, and that's what it's training on. So it knows the ancient Greek really well, okay? Um, so so this guy is like your, like your typical preterist. What they're going to do is they're going to point you to stuff like the blood moons, John Hagee's blood moons, and say, this is what all futurists believe. And then they're gonna to try to pull you into preterism, okay? Now, I literally taught my Revelation class, which turned into my Revelation book, based on calling this crap out as bull crap, okay? Dispensationalists get into this. Here's the thing, all of your date setting prophecies, all of your date, I want you guys to hear me, all of your date setting prophecies are, are made by exactly two groups of people. One is your Adventist Hebrew roots camp, and that's going to include your Jehovah Witnesses because they're descended from them. And the other is your dispensationalists, your pre-trib dispensationalists, okay? Those are the two people that make the false predictions. All of them are one of those two, okay? All of them, 100%. 100%, okay? Historical premillennialists and, and futurists like myself that are based on the ancient history of the church are going to make one prediction. And that prediction is the same prediction that is right in the Bible. And I'm going to show it to you because... I tried to get this guy to look at it, this Tom Bombadil guy, and he wouldn't. He, he refused to look at it. And I go, he, he's literally going to say in this video, like, nobody can know what the abomination of desolation is. And then he's going to go on to try to convince you that our gathering together unto the Lord is just the body of Christ being joined with Christ. Okay? Now... I want you to read this because I couldn't get this guy to look at this passage. He says, I said, now I beseech, beseech you, brethren, uh, by, the, by the coming of our Lord and our gathering together in him. Now, here's me with my lack of knowledge of Greek, and I'm going to show you what he means. Now, okay, this word beseech you, I ask you, okay? It's like saying I pray to you. I, I, I'm asking you, brethren, you, brethren, Hooper, over the coming of our Lord. So it's he's saying about the coming of our Lord. 
um, Jesus Christ and our being gathered together, episunagage with him, okay? Um, unto an epi um, means unto... It means like gathered upon him, okay? So you were literally going to go to his person, okay? If you go watch my video on Paralambano, it's going to be in my um, mid-tribulation proofs. It literally means to be brought alongside of him, okay? So gathered upon him um, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by a spirit nor by a word, as from us, that the day of the Lord is at hand. See, the day of Christ is at hand. He's going to tell you it's already passed, Okay. And he's going to say, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come unless there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who sits and opposes himself above all that is called that God or that is worshipped, so that he sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay? See, you don't need a fancy chart for that. You don't need anything but just reading. So if somebody's telling you that the day of the Lord or the day of Christ has, has come, and we've already been gathered together unto him, they're lying to you because that's not going to happen until this guy sits in the temple of God and shows that he's God. Okay. Now the entire, when, when Paul wrote this, the temple in Jerusalem was still standing and everybody understood the temple of God was talking about the temple of Jerusalem. And if you look at everything from like the first 500 years of Christianity, they interpreted this and Matthew 24 in the book of Revelation as describing the Antichrist sitting in the literal temple of God in Jerusalem and coming. It wasn't until Augustine convinced everybody that the kingdom of God coming is not a literal thing uh, that people started coming up with different ideas, okay? But still, into like the first thousand years of the church, they basically held on to this. And then, when you get to the Protestants, the Protestants start saying that the Pope is the Antichrist. And there's a problem. There's no temple in Jerusalem. And so they start coming up with all these stupid ideas about how the temple of God is the church, so they can make the Pope the Antichrist. It's in their confessions, it's in your, it's in the London Baptist Confession that your Reformed people uh, build off of, uh, your Reformed Baptists build off of, it's in, it, it's in your Westminster Confession, it's, it's in your Lutheranism, they all believe the Pope was the literal Antichrist, okay? And Jesus is saying, no, the, the, the man of lawlessness is the guy who sits in the temple and shows himself off that he's God, okay? Now, if you go read Daniel, which is what Jesus says to do, that's, this, is, this is where Paul gets this. It talks about this guy blaspheming God, sitting in the temple, and it calls it the abomination of desolation, and Paul just summarizes everything Daniel says right here. We know it's going to happen in the middle of Daniel's 70th week, and it's going to be in the future, and I can show you that from Hippolytus at the beginning of the third century. Okay? In his commentary on Daniel, you can look that up online, okay? Now, I'm not going to do that here, because I'm just going to show you the, just the top five fails from this guy, okay? he He's an example of preterism, because he was such a troll in telling me how ignorant I am of the Greek, and that I don't understand how, why he literally is just like, oh, a scalpel's better than a shotgun, and because he's such a perfect Greek scholar, apparently, he can negate anything I say in the plain English, okay? So let's see what he has to say here part in the Bible where it talks about the moon will turn to blood, and so he coined this term blood moons, which is supposedly a certain number of full moons in the same cycle or something. There's going to be four of them. Anyways, that didn't pan out as oh, we all know. The world didn't end. Nothing bad happened at all. Just recently, this past September, you may remember September 23rd, uh, supposedly. So we're going to stick with Matthew 24, and we'll use that as our guide to see about other things later on. But that's why this video is going to focus mostly on Matthew 24. So just so you guys know, the reason why these guys want to focus on Matthew 24 um, as the proof text for everything else and dictate the book of Revelation by Matthew 24 is because what they're going to try to convince you is that Luke 21 and Matthew 24 are the same speech. They're not the same speech. They're different speeches. And then because Luke 21 is partly talking about 70 AD, they're going to tell you that Matthew 24 is talking about 70 AD. 
And everybody in the early church knew that Revelation was written 25 years after 70 AD. It's literally writ written in 95 CE. Jerome tells you that in the 5th century, okay? And that was undisputed. That was everybody up to Jerome all, all agreed in that, including the amillennialists, including Augustine, all of these guys, all the way up to 1875. Everybody agreed that the book of Revelation was written by John, who was in prison during the reign of Domitian, and that was in the 90s, after 70 AD. These guys in the 1890s start coming up with different excuses for why it's not true. And they're so dumb, they want you to think that because there's a legend in Tertullian that John was boiled in oil and lived, never mind it was just a legend, we don't have any evidence of it, we just have a hundred and some years after John, this story pop up on the opposite side of the Mediterranean. So we don't know if it's true or not, but he equates that to Nero put, um, putting, covering people in pitch and lighting them on fire, okay? Now, boiling in oil is how you make a French fry. Covering somebody in pitch and lighting them on fire is how you make a torch, okay? They're two very different things, but because they both involve an oil-based product, these preterists say, well, that had to be in the reign of Nero then. That's how dumb their argument is, okay? That's their baseline. Now, they really don't want you to read the book of Revelation. They just want you to say it's symbolic and nobody can really understand it. That's what they want you to believe. And so then they're going to go to Matthew 24, which is a much shorter passage for them to negate with a lot more phrases they could take out of context um, and a lot less things they have to prove, you know, isn't, isn't what it seems like because it's talking about something that's prophesied again and again in the Old Testament. They, don't, they just don't want you to touch Revelation. They want you to look at Revelation and go, you know what, it's just an allegory. Nobody can understand its meanings. And what they really don't want to tell you is, I don't understand its meaning. Because they know it was written after 70 AD, and they don't want to talk about it. They, they wish it wasn't in your Bible, okay? Rules. So what are we going to do in this little study? We're going to use, first we're going to use only the Bible. There's a lot of great articles and videos and all kinds of people having opinions about things, but we're going to stick with just what the Bible says, apart from possibly referencing historical works. Whatever the Bible says is what we're going to go with. Now, his first rule is only use the Bible except for referencing historical works. The Bible says, apart from possibly referencing historical works. Whatever the Bible says is what we're going to go with. We're going to do a, use a methodology called let scripture interpret scripture, if you've ever heard that. And what that means is if you read a scripture and you don't understand it, we're going to look for other places in the Bible that that phrase or word has been used and try to understand if that helps us shed any more light on what it's talking about. If okay, then he's going to say we're only going to use scripture with scripture. And here's what he's going to do, and this is what preterists tend to do. They're going to use it, take a similar or equivalent phrase from an entirely different context and then use that context to dictate the context of what they're saying rather than just reading the, the, the context and using common sense, okay? So he's telling you he's only going to have you interpret Scripture with Scripture, but what he really is going to do is lead you away from just reading the passage in context and processing it to these other passages that are talking about something totally different and then say, well, he's using the same words here as he's using here. Therefore, that context dictates the context in this passage. That is not true. That's called eisegesis, okay? He's going to take passages that are talking about this present generation, and he's going to say, well, that's talking about that. Then he's going to take passages about people being gathered together in the body of Christ and say, well, that's what he's talking about when he sends out his angels to gather his elect from the four winds of heaven. And Paul is going to flat out tell you, no, that's the literal rapture. That's us who are alive being caught up to meet Christ in the crowds after those who are dead are raised, okay? He's going to deny this. This guy is a full-blown heretic, and I want you guys to hear this. When you deal with these people, don't let them shame you into maintaining conversation with them. You show them their error as simply as possible. You give them one warning, and if they won't listen, you're done with them. Now, this guy, I gave like seven warnings. I literally pointed him to another video like four times and said, watch this. I clarify what I said. I literally m admitted the mistake I made over and over and over again. And all he kept saying was, you're just so ignorant that nobody should listen to anything you say. And I'm going, somebody who is ignorant of something who starts out by saying, I'm not trained in the Greek, here's where I'm getting my information from, here's what it is, boom. And then you criticize it and somebody says, you made a mistake, and that person goes, hmm, maybe you're right, and goes and you know tweaks what they're saying. 
That's called somebody who's teachable. People like this are not teachable. See, you give them new information and they're gonna look for a reason to reject it. They give you new information, you're gonna look for a reason to consider it. And see, they just don't wanna do that. See, their whole point is to find a flaw in you so they can negate everything you say. So we wanna play that game, we're gonna play that game, okay? If we're in doubt on a word, we're not going to use English words, dictionaries. We're going to use Greek dictionaries. And that's because the original New Testament manuscript, manuscripts are 100% written in Greek. This is a picture of how it actually looks. You may note that there's, uh, there's no chapter breaks in passages like this. There's no footnotes. See, what he's going to do is he's going to say, we're going to go to Greek manuscripts so that I can take you into information that you probably don't know about and then try to deceive you into thinking this word must always mean this. It always means this in every tense. Until you get to something like this generation, then he's going to say no matter what the Greek tense is, no matter what the Greek words he uses, no matter what the context of the passage is, this generation must always mean what I want it to mean. And when Jesus says, barely I say unto you, it must always mean the present generation as well. Okay, Which basically throws out all the Gospels as being irrelevant to us. Okay, Wait, wait for this. There's not even spaces in between words, which is really amazing. And also we're going to practice audience relevance. Audience relevance is who the scripture was written to and putting yourself in their shoes, what's going on in their lives, who it was written to, where it was written, when it was written, why it was written, all those are immensely important in understanding. Okay, then when he gets to audience relevance, he's gonna try to tell you it's the present tense audience that he's talking to. The scripture is not written to you, okay? Let me tell you how, what a bad doctrine this is, okay? Jesus says to his apostles that those who believe in him through their words have eternal life, okay? Those words need to go to us. And I'm going to show you numerous times where Jesus says something to the apostles that looks like he's talking to them and just them, but it's really for us too. Because the apostles didn't write down what Jesus said to them to have private meaning for just them. If they were doing that, they would say, he said this to Peter, or he said this to John, or he was talking about Judas right here. Okay? Everything else is to all of us literally everything else unless like he's telling you the audience he's saying this to these pharisees right here if he's just saying you or you all he's talking to all of his disciples for all time okay almost nothing that he's saying is just for the disciples of that era and this guy wants to deceive you into thinking that all these things that jesus says are just for the disciples of that era that is a falsehood, okay? That is an absolute falsehood. And if you take what he says to its fullest logical extent, then none of the Gospels are for you, okay? What actually is going on? We can't just take a section of Scripture and say it's talking about today if it has a context of ancient times. So okay. Again, if a passage of Scripture is talking about stuff that happens around Jesus' second coming, guess what? It's about Jesus' second coming. It's not about 70 A.D. Unless Jesus came in 70 AD, he appeared in the clouds, every eye saw him, he came in a flash of lightning, the sun and the moon were darkened, and then he sent out his angels, resurrected the dead, and raptured them all into heaven in 70 AD. Well, that's just for them, okay? But we know he didn't. Not only do we know we, he didn't, we have hundreds of years of church writings that tell you he didn't. We don't have anybody claiming that he did until these preterists in the late 19th century. That's when they invented this, okay? Most of all, you're gonna to have to have an open mind. This is probably gonna fly in the face of what a lot of you have been taught your whole life. This is, I, I came up with the standard view that there's gonna be a seven year period of tribulation coming, a terrible time. Okay, he didn't come up with the standard view that there's gonna be a seven year tribulation, okay? That view is as old as the apostles. That's why you can find it in the second century. It's a very old view, okay? All you need to do is you need to do the math on Daniel's 70th weeks and go, how many of those 70 weeks can you possibly fit before Christ's coming? Because he says there's going to be 69 weeks and then Messiah is going to be cut off. That's what he says. He says after 69 weeks, Messiah is going to be cut off. Well, where do you put that 70th week? Okay, And that 70th week, you've only ever had two, two possible interpretations. Some people put that 70th week in 70 AD, and other people put that 70th week in the distant future. The only people in the ancient past who put that 70th week in 70 AD are Clement and Tertullian. That's it. That's it. They both use totally different math as their starting point. They both have a totally different 
point of time when Jesus, when when that 69th week comes and when it reaches Jesus' birth and all these things, they have totally different history to try to wedge it in. And then they both somehow magically get that 70th week to go to 70 AD while negating the fact that Jesus needs to be cut off after the 69th week and then the 70th week has to be when the rest of these things are fulfilled in Daniel, okay? The earliest commentary on Daniel puts that 70th week in the future. This isn't something he figured out. This isn't something the Dispies figured out. The Dispies got this from uh, Edward Irving, who got it from Emmanuel Lacunza, who got it from the ancient church fathers, okay? I've read all these manuscripts, okay? It's not a mystery where it came from. The Darbius didn't invent this. The Dispensationalists didn't invent this. But this guy doesn't read church history, and when you put the writings right in front of him, he'll look away. Okay, so this is what's called an unteachable person. He's going to tell you all he knows about the Greek, and he's going to butcher that too. Times coming in, times the end of the world, Armageddon, all that stuff. Um, and what I'm going to teach you here today, or show you with the Bible, what the Bible's going to teach, is may fly in the face of what you know. So you're going to have to unlearn what you have learned. Take a, a note from Master. What, what he's what he's really preparing you to do. What he's really preparing you to do is forget what you see when you read with your own eyes, and listen to what I'm going to tell you. Okay. Yoda. You must unlearn. So you must talk backwards like Yoda. Times, forget about the end of the world, or what you think you know about Jesus' second coming, coming back. And let's just look at what the Bible says about those things and see if we can draw conclusions based on that. A lot of people just take one verse out of the Bible and they will fit it to their needs without looking again the context of who, what, when, why, all that sort of a thing. Uh, but the context is immensely important. For instance, without context, the Bible says in Hosea 1-2 to go marry a prostitute and have children with her. So, and it does say that. You can go look it up. But the context of that verse is that that's what God told the prophet to do, to teach a lesson some other, to the Israelites of the day and how they were being unfaithful and he wanted to you know, have a picture story with them. So it's not condoning that we should do that again. So if you take that verse out of its context, that's what that means. So that's why the context makes a big deal. Matthew 24 is very sequential. It says this is going to happen, then this is going to happen, then this is happened, this is going to happen right through all through the chapter. So we're going to use that as our context as to what's going on. To begin with the setting of Matthew 24, Jesus wasn't in Jerusalem through most of his ministry. He starts off, uh, after he starts his ministry, he goes out to the surrounding towns and villages, he goes to the towns of Samaritans, he goes back and forth to other places. And in starting in chapter 16, he starts telling the disciples that they're going to, uh, he's going to have to go to Jerusalem and they're going to kill him and all that sort of a thing. We get into chapter 20. It says in verse 17, Now as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples and said to them, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have a bunch more parables. But you can see what happens between chapter 20 and uh, to 21 is uh, them traveling uh, to Jerusalem. He gets to Jerusalem in chapter 21. And you may have heard the story. It's called the triumphal entry, where he gets to Jerusalem, and he's riding on the donkey, and they say, Hosanna to the son of David. And they put down the palm fronds, and they're, they're just uh, praising him, and, uh, and they're welcoming him as a great king. Uh, the funny thing to think about is, where does he go on that donkey? A lot of people know. Uh, the triumphal entry story about him riding in, uh, into Jerusalem on a donkey and being praised, but he goes somewhere on that donkey, and that's important. That's the first thing he does. He, he, right when he gets to Jerusalem, he makes a beeline for a certain spot. So let's look and see what it says. And then it says in verse 10, When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in the Galilee. And then it says in verse 12, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out who were buying and selling there. He overtell, overturned the tables of the money changers and the, and the benches of those who were selling doves. So where does he go? Where does he do? And he's got all this acclade in this section right here. He, he insults him over and over again. Uh, see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So that's the context. Then you have chapter 24. Again, he had just had the triumphal entry. He gave all the parables of condemnation. He condemns the Pharisees. He appeals to the crowds. And again, he gets the maddest he's ever been to the Pharisees. And then in chapter 24, it says, and Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up and pointed him the temple buildings to him. That's immensely important. So that's, he is leaving this area of condemning, of overturning the tables, and he's leaving out of the temple. And don't forget what he just said. You know, He's, he's condemning everything. All this is going to come upon this generation. All the righteous blood that is sent on earth. Your house is being left to you de desolate. And Jesus is leaving. And Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he said? I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left upon another. Every one will be thrown down. So is history on Jesus' side here? And actually, yes. Uh, Josephus records that when Jerusalem was, when the temple was burned uh, by the Romans and Prince Titus in 70 AD, uh, the gold that was in the temple, the whole thing was covered in gold, it actually melted into the cracks of the foundation. And the Romans pried up the, the foundation stones to get to the gold. Actually, the stones that fell to the street below, uh, they, they crushed the street when they fell. So that's, that's the, the foundation for the beginning of Matthew 24. He says every one of these things is going to be thrown down. As verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives is right across from the temple. So they went from leaving the temple. He says every one of these stones are going to be thrown down. And it says in verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They associated when this happened uh, to be his coming and the end of their age, which age is just... That when Jesus says... Okay, notice these are two different things. Here he's coming out of the temple as they went out and departed from the temple. Here's later that night, okay? 
And notice he says, tell us when shall these things be, okay? And then he asks a second question, and what will be your, the sign of your coming of the end of the world, okay? Now, you need to look at the parallel passages to this because if you, if you look up any of my videos on Matthew 24, this is a compilation, okay? It's skipping everything he says in Luke 21, and it's not going to repeat it, and it's going to go here, and it's going to talk about Luke 21, Luke 17, Luke 12, like half a dozen things in uh, Luke, okay? But it's going to compile them all, all right here. All of Matthew is stylistically like that. That's why when you get to Luke, where he says, um, it seemed to me, having had a perfect understanding of all these things from the very, very first, to write to the in order most excellent Theophilus. See, he is telling you that he is going to write things kathe kathexis, okay? Kathexis. Kathexis is consecutively. That's what he means. I'm going to write to you consecutively. In other words, he's going to give you a strict consecutive order when these things happen. Matthew is not a strict consecutive order. The early church knew it wasn't in strict consecutive order, and that's what Luke's telling you. It's a collection of the things that are commonly believed about Jesus, okay? And that's why when you get to Mark, Mark is Peter's recitation of a proto-Matthew. And so when you get to Mark 13, his is going to be even shorter than Matthew 24 because he's going to tell him about the stones of the building and them being thrown down, and then as he sat on the Mount of Olives, see how it sounds just like Matthew? Um, when will the sign of these things be fulfilled, okay? Now notice he said, when will these th things be and when will be the sign when all these things shall be, be fulfilled? Notice that says something totally different than what Matthew says, okay? So that's a different conversation. And then when you get to Matthew 24, which is the most complete version of it, there are multiple questions. So he's telling you, these are the two questions he asked him. Now notice how Mark just asks, when are these things going to be fulfilled? And he's just talking about the destruction of the temple. Notice we're going to get show you show you the same thing in Luke 21. Luke 21, he's going to talk about the destruction of the temple. And they're just going to say, when will these things be? Okay, notice they only say, when will these things be? But in Matthew 24, this is a longer conversation that they're compiling here. So in Matthew 24, they're going to start out the conversation by telling you the two questions they asked. The one is going to be, when will these things be? That's in Mark 13, and that's in Luke 21. And then this other one, what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? That's something different, okay? Whether you use end of the world or end of the age, it's no different, okay? The point is, is there are two different things they're asking about. One is the destruction of the temple, and one is 70 AD. Now, my Matthew 24 book go, or my Matthew 24 videos go into this in excruciating detail, okay? But what they're talking about is things that are going to happen immediately and continually, and then things that are going to be at the end. And that's why he says things like, but the end is not yet, okay? But he's going to then talk about other things and say, this gospel will be preached throughout the world as a witness to all the eight nations, and then the end will come. So notice he's asking, when's the sign of your coming and the end of the age, okay? So all this stuff right here could apply to 70 AD, and he says similar things in Luke 21. There are two different discourses, but he says similar things. But when he starts saying, then the end shall come, this is something different. And he's going to talk about the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel. Now, that's what Paul talks about, okay? Now, this guy's going to say, nobody can really know what the abomination of desolation is. Yeah, we can. He just tells you to go and go to Daniel and read it, and he says, and let the reader understand, okay? Some translations will say, go to Daniel and read, and then you'll understand, okay? And that's what Paul does to get a second Thessalonians 2. This guy is going to be willfully ignorant of that. I have tried to put it in front of him, and he doesn't want to look at it, okay? He says, I just determined what Matthew 24 says by Luke 21. Well, that's not what Jesus says to do. Now, he's going to run you around all throughout the Bible, but you know where he's not going to take you to? He's not going to take you right to where Jesus tells you to go, which is Daniel. Jesus tells you to go to Daniel. When he says, whoso reads, let him understand, he's telling you to go read Daniel. You know where this guy's not going to go? He's going to go everywhere in the Bible but Daniel and 2 Thessalonians, which is interpreting Daniel. Okay? So this guy's smarter than Jesus, apparently, because Jesus says, when you go to Daniel, you'll understand what the abomination of desolation is. This guy says, I'm not going to bother to go to Daniel, and who can possibly know what the abomination of desolation is? You know what that sounds like? 
sounds like somebody who says, where's the sign of his coming? Because ever since the world has gone on, it's always been like this, and people are always doing the same thing, and it's always the same thing. Okay, That's what people like this do. They don't listen to Jesus and do what he said to do, and then they're going to give you their own theories. And watch him go everywhere but Daniel, okay? So is this talking about the end of the world here? If you have a King James Bible, you notice it says the end of the world. But that word there that means age is aeon, and that word should never be translated as world. That's an incorrect translation. Aeon is where we get the word eon, uh, or just a, a space of time. Another thing you want to think about as we're going through this is who is Jesus talking to now? He's sitting on the Mount of Olives. His disciples come up and they ask him, what will be the, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And, you know, verse 4, it says, Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. And that's the beginning of the audience relevance in this passage. No one deceives you. Who's you? He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to the disciples. It's them, you, not you, you. You have Jesus. Now, you know how I know that that's not just for the disciples? First of all, none of the disciples were in Jerusalem in 70 AD. Second of all, Paul's going to say the exact same thing to the Thessalonians. This is a summary of what Jesus said on Matthew 24. Notice he says, don't let anyone deceive you by letter as from us as if uh, Christ has come or Christ, the, the, the day of the Lord has come and are gathering unto, uh, together unto him. Don't let anyone deceive you unless there's a falling away and the man of sin is revealed. He's describing the abomination of desolation. This guy doesn't want to read that passage. He wants to remain willfully ignorant of that passage and give you his own theory. So let's see what his theory is. Jesus using the second person plural, you, over and over again. You will hear wars, rumor of the wars, many come in your name. See that you are not. So Jesus is going to use the second person plural throughout his ministry. And he's not just talking to the apostles. He's talking to all of his disciples. And everything that he says to the apostles that they're writing down is meant to be communicated to all the disciples. Audience relevance doesn't matter unless he's specifying a specific audience that he's talking to. And yes, he's saying it to the apostles, but when he says, when you see, either those apostles have to literally see those things, which none of them did, or he's talking in general, okay? Now, I'm going to give you a big, huge hint here. When Jesus says, let the reader understand, that's a big, fat hint. This is not just for the apostles, Otherwise, they wouldn't bother to say, let the reader understand, okay? They would just say, oh, here's what he meant, but it's just for us. He's not going to give you an instruction to go read Daniel if it's just for the apostles. Common sense. Not deceived. Then you will be handed, persecuted, put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. You get down to verse 34. Verse 34 is going to be an important part of this. So, verse 30. so notice how he just skips. He skips to things. I, I want to show you where he's skipping, what he's skipping. It's going to be all the most important part of this, the meat and potatoes. He's going to say, he's going to say, and you will be hated for all namesake. And then he's going to be like, you know what? Forget the rest of this. Let's just go right to 34 so I can get you to eisegete this generation. Okay, when I put out a video and say that these guys hyper focus on you thinking about this generation as if it can only mean the present tense generation, here's a perfect example. When somebody skips 25 verses to get you to jump to this generation from uh, you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake, well, there's something that could apply to just the apostles. And again, like I told you, everything up to but then the end shall come could apply to all the apostles, except when he says, and he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Okay, this is talking about the end. This other stuff can apply to the apostles. That's why he wants you to jump from there to verse 34, which is this generation. Okay? He doesn't want you to see all the stuff that the apostles don't didn't see. Okay? Because he wants you to think it's just about them. So let's go back to his foolhardiness. Thirty-four says, I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. That's a very important, important passage. Jesus uses the term this generation over and over again in the Gospels. And every time without fail, he uses this generation. It's always referring to the generation to whom he was talking to. We just said in, in chapter 23, in verse 36, you know, you snakes, you brood of vipers, I tell you the truth, this, all this will come upon this generation. Now, what he's doing is exactly what the guy who invented preterism is doing, okay? He takes you to all these passages that are talking about the present tense generation and says every time, without fail, that Jesus is this generation, 
he is talking about the present tense generation. And he uses passages that are talking about the present tense generation as proof that he's talking about this generation in this generation, okay? Now, when people come to my channels and say, oh, you're acting like it's all built on this verse, here's a preterist. You, you think I'm the one saying it's all built on this verse? Why do you think he just read, he said, we're going to just focus on Matthew 24, and then when he gets to Matthew 24, he skips 25 verses to get to this generation and saying, this is the lens through which we must look at Matthew 24. Because that's the preterist position. That's what the first preterist book said, basically, okay? So all he's trying to do is teach you how to eisegete his view into the text. Every time you hear the words this generation, it's talking about the present tense generation. No, it's not. The word this literally just means what he's been talking about or what he's pointing to, and you have to get it from the context, okay? So go watch my other video to learn about that. You need to learn what the context is. He's going to get you to ignore the context and pretend your context is some different conversation that Jesus said instead of the conversation he's having right now. He's contending those Pharisees, and he's saying how terrible they are. And he said, all this will come upon this generation. Uh, back in verse 11, he uses this generation. Just give you a quick overview of some of the times this generation is used. In 11, 16, to what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplace. He's talking about the generation he's talking to there. In, uh, in Matthew 12, 41, 12, 42, 23, 36, and then again in verse 24, 34, where we're studying, it's a very important part. Verse 34 says, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And all these things are what he's going to list in Matthew 24. All this stuff that we've been told is the end of the world, Jesus says, this is going to take place in this before this generation passes away. And I know that sounds impossible. Everybody's been told since the time they were young that what well, things in Matthew 24 are going to be in our future. It's going to be a president of the world and an antichrist and all these things are going to happen. And I know it sounds uh, amazing. In fact, it says uh, wars, rumors of wars. We have that stuff now. Earthquakes, famines. We have those things now. Verse 14, the gospel shall be preached in the whole world. It says the sun will be darkened, the moon turned to blood. Uh, the son of man is going to appear in the sky. And I know what you'd be out there saying, are you saying all this is going to happen to that generation? You can't say that. And again, I'm not saying that. Jesus said that. The question is, do we believe what he said? And we should look at that and go over these things and see if it can be shown that these things did happen in that generation. Maybe we're understanding things incorrectly. Every commentator acknowledges that in verse 24, chapter 24, verse 34, he appears to be saying that all this stuff he talked about, this end of the, what people interpret as the end of the world stuff, is going to happen before that living generation passed away. Uh, their, their presupposition... Okay, what he just told you is an outright lie, okay? He literally just said every commentator out there is telling you that when Jesus is talking about this generation... He's talking about, uh, he, they're talking about the present tense generation and all those things be fulfilled. He just flat out lied to you and told you every single commentator teaches that, okay? Now, I've interacted with this guy, okay? And now let me tell you, he is obtuse. He is willfully ignorant. He won't look at the evidence you put in front of him, okay? So here's the book he's getting his stuff from. This is, this is, um... Uh, this is the Perusia. This is a careful look at the New Testament doctrine of our Lord's second coming by James Stuart Russell, okay? Now, every argument he's going to give you is in this book, okay? He's not coming up with anything unique, nor is he getting this by Greek exegesis. He's getting it from this book, whether he knows it or not. It's just been fed to him. Now, this book got famous because Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, ooh, I learned a lot from this book, and he mentions this book in his commentary on Matthew. Now, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, what they don't like to tell you, didn't agree with his interpretation of Matthew 24. But because he cited this guy in his commentary on Matthew, well, people say, well, maybe a very famous preacher did agree with him, and so therefore we should read this guy, okay? And based on this one guy alone, they all start changing their views in the 1880s and 1890s, okay? You need to learn church history. This is where his all the commentators start from. Nobody before 1875, okay? Now, so this is Hippolytus of Rome, early 3rd century AD. He's two people removed from the Apostle John, okay? I'm going to show you Irenaeus in a second. But he's two people removed from the Apostle John. He wrote the first commentary on Daniel. He wrote um, commentary on Christ and Antichrist. And he's going to tell you all this stuff that appeals to about Christ and Antichrist. And let me show you how many times he's going to cite Matthew 24 as being in the future. So we're going to start with the Didache. This is literally the oldest Christian catechism, hands down, all your scholars agree, from every denominational camp. This is the oldest Christian scholarship, okay? Now notice he's going to say, he's going to have a passage on watchfulness, the coming of the Lord. Okay, this is chapter 16. I don't care what versions you say. Listen to what it says. Watch for your life's sake. Let not your lamps be quenched, nor your loins be loose, but be ready, for you know not what hour the Lord comes. 
But as often as you come together, seeking the things that are befitting to your souls, for the whole time of faith will not profit you if you are not made perfect in the last time. For in the last days false prophets and corruptors will be multiplied, and the sheep shall be turned to wolves, and love shall be turned to hate. See, he's citing Matthew 24. For when lawlessness increases, they shall hurt and persecute and betray one another. Then shall appear the world deceiver as the Son of God. Remember how Paul said um, he's going to... Um, this, is, this was literally written but while the apostles are still alive. In fact, there's evidence in the early manuscripts of this thing that it was changed after the council in Jerusalem to add the thing about um, forbidding uh, to eating meat sacrificed to idols. That's how old it is, okay? Notice he says, And then shall the world deceiver as the, appear the world deceiver as the Son of God. That's exactly what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians. Who shall do signs and wonders, and the earth shall be delivered in his hands, and he shall do iniquitous things that have never yet come to pass since the beginning. And then the creation of men shall come a trial of fire, and many shall be made to stumble and perish, but they that endure in their faith will be saved from under the curse that says. So that's Matthew 24 he's quoting, okay? Then shall appear the signs of truth, first an outspreading in heaven, then the sign of the sound of the trumpet, then the third, the resurrection of the dead, yet not of all, but as it is said, the Lord shall come, and all his saints with him. And then the, the world, the world shall see the Lord coming on the clouds with heaven, okay? This was written before 70 A.D., this was written before 70 AD. And then Barnabas is going to write a commentary about this after 70 AD to tell the Jews that Jesus told them that the temple was going to be rebuilt by the same people who destroyed it. Okay? So show this to this guy, Tom Bombadil, because he thinks he's really smart and he doesn't want to listen to reason. Okay? That's the Didache. Now you're going to go to Irenaeus. He is one person removed from the Apostle John. Okay? One... There's one guy in between him, the guy who wrote the book of Revelation. His name is Polycarp. And he, as a youth, lived with Polycarp and was discipled by him. He writes this as an old man, okay? So he knew a guy who knew John for like 30 years, okay? And then he knows that guy for like another 40 years, okay? So he also knows another guy who talked to two of the apostles. And they all say the same thing. Now listen to what this guy says. He's going to say, those nations, however, who do not themselves raise up their eyes to heaven, nor, nor give thanks to their mas uh, maker, nor behold the light of the truth, which shall come like blinded and con mice concealed in the depths of ignorance, as the world justly reckons, as waste waters from the sink, and the turning of weight in a balance, in fact nothing, so far as useful and serviceable to the just, as stubble conduces towards the growth of wheat and straw by means of comb combustion, works for the serving of gold. Now what is he saying? Now, if you know your scriptures well, he is talking about this is in Isaiah and this is in Malachi, how the wicked are basically going to be stubble for the fire and we're going to dance upon their ashes. Okay? He's literally talking about the end of the world. And then he says, And therefore, when in the end the church shall be suddenly caught up from this, this is literally the word harpazo, the word for rapture, it is said there shall be a tribulation such as not been at the beginning, neither shall be. That's quoting Matthew 24. For this is the last contest of the righteous in which they overcame are crowned with incorruption. Notice he's not saying this was fulfilled in 70 AD. He's saying this is the last end of everything. And he's quoting something from Matthew 24. Okay? So that's him. Now we're going to go to Hippolytus on Christ and Antichrist, okay? And he's going to write this book. You can you can listen to this on YouTube. It's free, or you can read it. It's free, or you can watch my video on it on my mid trib series. It's free too, okay? See, I give you guys free resources rather than saying, "Oh, you don't know the Greek. Let me tell you what the Greek says because I know things you don't, and I'm just going to deceive you." Okay? I'm actually showing you my sources. This guy's not doing that. He's just taking things out of context and then telling you what to think about it, okay? Now, just so you know, the guy who translated this is Philip Schaff. He is a preterist, okay? Go read his commentary. He is a preterist. Now, look at look at this. There's Matthew 24, 27 and 28. Why is he quoting this about Christ and the Antichrist? Now, let's see what he says. He said, these things then being come to pass, beloved one. Now notice this is written 200 years after 70 AD. Okay? Wrap your mind around that. These things then having come to pass, beloved, and the one week being divided into two parts. Now, in his commentary on Daniel, he says the 70th week of Daniel is in the future. And he says, and the abomination of desolation being manifested then, and the two prophets, forerunners of the Lord, having finished their course, and the whole world finally approaching the consummation, 
the whole world approaching the consummation, um, what remains but the coming of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from heaven, to, for whom we have looked to hope, who shall bring the conflagration in just judgment upon all who have refused to believe on him. For the Lord says, and when those things come to pass, you shall look up your head, for your redemption draws near. That's from Luke 21. And there shall be not a head of your hair, hair of your head perish, for as lightning comes out of the east and shines to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That's from Matthew 24. For wherever the carcasses, the eagles shall gather together. That's from Matthew 24. Now the fall took place in paradise, and Adam fell there, and he says again, Then the Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather his elect from the four winds of heaven. That's from Matthew 24. And David also, announcing prophetically the judgment of the Lord, says his coming is going forth from heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of heaven. And there is none hid from the light thereof, but the heat he means... Uh, by the heat he means conflagration and Isaiah speaks thus come thy people enter the, into thy chambers and hide theirself for a little moment until the indignation of the Lord be overpassed and Paul in like manner said the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness that's from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 okay he just takes 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and smushes it together with Matthew 24 just like the Didache does and he tells you those two things are talking about the same thing. And all this is after 70 AD, okay? So for this guy who is telling you that all the commentaries say this was fully fulfilled in Jesus' generation, he's deceiving the simple. He's just lying, okay? I'm calling him out as a liar, a false prophet, a false teacher, and a heretic because he's telling you things that are in the future. He's deceiving you about prophecy, and I've tried to put the information in front of him, and he's just a liar. You don't deal with these people. You don't let them comment on your channels. You don't play nice with them. You don't say, my brother this, my brother that. They're just liars, okay? Just like the Pope, just like any other liar, okay? ...on how they want to interpret this passage that way, though, won't allow it. I'm again asking us to go back and to actually forget everything we know and to take Jesus at his word and just go through these things, and one by one we're going to go through the whole chapter and decide if, if that actually is the case or not, and you can decide. So notice he, notice he just told you, we're going to do this by scripture alone, and then he goes on to tell you all the commentators agree with what I'm telling you. If he's getting it from all the commentators, why is he telling you he's getting it from scripture alone? And the answer is, it's because he's not getting it from scripture alone. He's getting it from the commentators he prefers, okay? I would I mean that case or not. But forget what you think is supposed to happen, and let's look at what it says. So 24 or 34 is just a key passage. And I'm going to share a couple things about why, how people, these commentators, get around verse 24 or 34. You may notice in a footnote of your Bible, it might say race. It says, meaning, uh, into the center, this race will not pass away. The only thing that will not happen before this race passes away. So the problem there is there is a Greek word for race. It's genos. Uh, the word here is genea, which is generation. This is not the word for race. But you also have a logical problem. I'll tell you the truth. This race will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. The problem with that there is what happens after all these things have happened. The implication is that the Jewish race passes away. Uh, but that can't be because after the tribulation, after the end of the world, end times, there's supposed to be a thousand year reign. Uh, and so that, that can't be. Again, you have to add words in it. To go back and to actually forget everything we know and to take Jesus at his word and just go through it around it as it says, uh, this generation that sees these signs will not pass away until all these things take place. Meaning that whenever generation starts to see these signs, then all these things are going to happen before that generation passes away, which is kind of a silly thing to say to begin with, because if, if that generation sees it, of course they're going to see it. It's, it seems irrelevant for it to happen. Plus, it's adding words in the text again. It doesn't say the generation that sees these signs. It says this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. You've got to remove this, and you've got to put in generation that sees these signs. He could have just said that. That generation will not pass away until all these things take place, if he had a, a further generation in mind. But he didn't. He said, this generation will not pass away. And the disciples would have heard that, and they would have interpreted it that way. He already told them, you are going to hear of wars. You are going to see hear of earthquakes. You are going to be persecuted. They took all that up personally. The whole chapter is to them. Bertrand Russell, in his book, Why I'm Not a Christian, he cites, you can't say that. And again, I'm not saying that. Jesus said that. The question is, do we believe what he said? And we should look at that, and the word here is genea, which is generation. This is not the word for race. But you also have a logical problem. It might say race. It says, meaning, uh, into the center, this race will not pass away. The, all these things will not happen before this race passes away. So the problem there is there is a Greek word for race. It's genos. Uh, the word here is genea, which is generation. Generation that sees these signs will not pass away until all these things take place. Meaning that whatever generation starts to see these signs, then all these things are going to happen before that generation passes away. Which is kind of a silly thing to say to begin with, because if, if that generation sees it, of course they're going to see it. That's, it seems irrelevant for it to happen. Plus, it's adding words into the text again. It doesn't say the generation. So this guy is going to tell you that it's irrelevant that Jesus says this generation will not pass till all these things are going to be fulfilled after he says um, all these things, okay? For one, this generation can be translated that generation. I showed you a Hebrew um, translation of this that translates it to that generation when they translate it back to English, okay? Now, so 
so it can mean that generation. Number two is the reason he's saying when you see all these things, and then he says to all these things be fulfilled, one sentence after the other, is because he wants you to know that all of these things are going to happen in a single generation, not over a thousand years. That way people can't trick you into being deceived into Seventh-day Adventism or Jehovah's Witnesses or any of these other cults that try to spread it out over a thousand years and say it was leading up to us and we're the true church, okay? Just so you know, preterism is just another version of that. They're saying we're the true church and it's already been fulfilled, okay? Paul's telling you don't be deceived to, by anybody who's saying the coming of the Lord or our being gathered to him is any time before the abomination of desolation. He's telling you that flat out, okay? So this guy's a deceiver. He's going to try to get you to think that, nope, nope, that happened a long time ago and we're the true church, okay? Generation that sees these signs. It says this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. You got to remove this and you got to put in generation that sees these signs. He could have just said that. That generation will not pass away until all these things take place if he had a, a further generation in mind. But he didn't. He said, this generation will not pass away. And the disciples would have heard that and they would have interpreted it that way. He already told them, you were going to hear of wars. You were going to see hear of earthquakes. You were going to be persecuted. They took all that up personally. The whole chapter is to them. Bertrand Russell, in his book, Why I'm Not a Christian, he cites this verse as one of the reasons he's not a Christian because Jesus predicted that he was going to come back and, in that generation and he didn't. And that's one of his reasons why he's not a Christian. And again, Okay, again, I thought we were just going to stick with Scripture. Why is he bringing up what an atheist thinks? Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell is an atheist. I'll tell you why he doesn't believe in Jesus, because he loves his sin. That's what the Bible says. It's not because of the, the, the words these generations, okay? Just so you know, Bertrand Russell, he's a guy who lived from 1870 to 1970, most of his life after preterism was invented. Okay, so I don't care what a 20th century atheist thinks because he believed preterism. Now look, look, what's his background? He went to Cambridge. He was one of the Cambridge apostles. Do you know what the Cambridge apostles did? They came up with the United Nations. Wrap your mind around that, okay? So he, here, here, who he's a Fabian socialist. He's a, he's a guy. He's just an atheist, and he's saying, well, the reason I don't believe it is because I bought into preterism that said all these things happened in 70 AD, and what is he telling you history's told him? These things didn't happen in 70 AD. And so that's why he started with preterism and went from there to unbelief, okay? That's what Bertrand Russell's telling you. But I thought he was just gonna stick with the Bible. Why is he going into Bertrand Russell? Again, that's, we have to be able to defend this. And uh, the way I'm gonna show you today is just taking the words at face value and just understanding them as they are. See, and he's saying, we can better defend the gospel against atheists if we just get rid of all the things that the Bible says is going to happen in the future. No, we can't. You're standing under stu uh, uh, an atheist idea of what it means based on him reading it from preterism. Okay? Preterism leads to unbelief. I'm sorry, but all your, all your historical critical uh, exegesis leads to unbelief. These guys brought atheism into the church. These guys brought the idea that the flood was just a local event into the church. These guys brought the idea that Mo Moses didn't part the Red Sea. He just walked over a sea of reeds. They brought that into the church. They brought Darwin's theistic evolution into the church so they could be racist against black people. All this came in through the Presbyterians, the same people who brought you preterism. Okay? All your liberal theology came from, came from the exact same people until some of these guys split away from them in basically the, the early 1900s, okay? It all came in through, through the Presbyterians into America. Again, people are thinking, there's no way you can convince me that this is going to be, all this stuff happened already. And again, I just want you to suspend your doubt. We have to take Jesus at his word and just figure out what he means. Or you might as well just forget the whole thing. If, you're, if, you, if you can't defend what Jesus says, if, or if Jesus was wrong about this, you might as well all give up. Because the Bible couldn't be true if Jesus told things incorrectly. Okay, uh, coming. They were under the impression Jesus was coming to do this. He, they said, when these uh, one stone here will not be left on another. And the disciples asked them, tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? They interpreted his coming with them destroying the temple and all these different signs here. So the question is, how does the Bible use the word coming? Often coming is just a reference to God's judgment and not a physical, literal coming. And it's used that way lots of times. For instance, let's go to Isaiah 19 in the Old Testament in verse 1. And this is just an Old Testament prophecy about Egypt. Now... Why is he taking you to the Old Testament to find out um, where, where do you get the Lord's coming from when we've got all these references to it in the New Testament, okay? Now, just so you know, just go to the New Testament and go, coming, boom, coming of Christ, 2 Peter, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Colossians, or Colossians, or 1 Corinthians. Look at all of these. All of these are about the coming of the Lord, okay? 
so that you don't become behind in any gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Even to rejoice at the presence of our Lord at his coming, okay? First Thessalonians, um, that you may establish yourself unblameable in holiness uh, even to the Father and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians uh, uh 523. Why? It's talking about the rapture. It's talking about Jesus' second coming. Second Thessalonians. He's not going to go here. Brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together, don't let anyone deceive you that that day, the day of the Lord's coming, shall not come until the Son of Man, or until the, uh, the um, man of perdition comes. Okay? Now, why is he taking you to Isaiah? Because those are prophecies that he can obscure. See, we don't go to the Old Testament to come up with our own interpretation of what they meant. We look through the lens of what the apostles and Jesus told us. That's why he tells you to go to Daniel. That's why he tells you to go to Daniel. Now I'm going to show you this passage he's going to go to in Isaiah, just so you know. This is the burden of Egypt in Isaiah 19. Do you know what it's talking about? Listen to this. The Lord rides on a swift cloud. This is the last day's prophecy. You know how I know? He says, I will set Egyptians against Egyptians, and they shall fight everyone against his brother and everyone against his neighbor, city against city and city against kingdom. When did that happen in ancient times? It didn't. This is going to happen yet in the future. You know how I know it's going to happen in the future? Because he says, and the water shall fail from the sea, and the river shall be wasted and dried up. Do you know how many times in history the Nile River has been dried up? This many. This many. This is how many times the Nile River is going to, has dried up. Do you know when the Nile River is starting to dry up? right now. Do you know why? Because the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam project is drying up the Nile River and they're saying it's going to be dried up within a few years. Go read that. Go look up the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam project and realize the longest, most continuous, most unobstructed, most consistent river in the world. Egypt has been a breadbasket for the world because of the Nile River for all these centuries. And now it's rivers getting dried up. And all this stuff that's happening, civil war in Egypt, while, while this stuff is going up, has started with the Arab Spring, and it's happening right now. It's never happened in history. Now look where it ends. It ends with, it says, In that day there will be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and Assyria shall come to Egypt, and the Egyptians to Assyria, and the Assyrians shall serve with the Egyptians. In that day shall Israel be a third with Egypt and Assyria, and a blessing in the midst of the land. Has that happened? Has Israel joined with Egypt and Assyria that we don't know about sometime in history? No. Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. When has that occurred? He's saying, oh, that's already fulfilled in the ancient past, but there's an example of the day of the Lord, because he's, there's the Lord riding in the clouds. No, there's other prophecies in Isaiah that are going to talk about Egypt and Assyria being claimed by the Lord in the last day, and there's going to be a highway that goes back and forth, and the gospel is going to go out through Egypt and Assyria. And that happens in a foretype with the disciples, but then it happens ultimately in the millennium. But he's going to tell you neither of those things. He's going to say that happened in the ancient past because the Lord coming on the clouds is just a generic term for the Lord passing judgment. And this prophecy is in the context of Nebuchadnezzar's armies. No, I'm sorry. This is Isaiah. The Assyrian armies coming to attack Egypt. Okay? Guess what didn't happen when that, when that happened? The, Egypt, the Nile River didn't dry up. And uh, yeah, Assyria and Babylon didn't join Assyria and Egypt and Israel into one gig, good, happy kingdom under the Lord's dominion. Okay? He's going to just ignorantly corrupt the text to try to make you more stupid. Okay? Being judged. And it says, An oracle concerning Egypt. See, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt tremble before him, and the hearts of the Egyptians melt within them. So here you see there, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. And you're going to see that language here in just a minute as well. So we have that, God did God actually come to Egypt? And did the idols actually tremble before him? And the hearts of the Egyptians actually melt? No, it's all symbolic for the judgment that was going to come on them. And I think this is in the same context here. So again, Jesus said the temple would be destroyed. This is what these guys always say. It's all symbolic. It's all symbolic. Symbolic for what? See, this is the question they never answer you. Symbolic for what? Reasons? See, they don't want to say, this is symbolic and here's what it symbolizes to all these prophecies they use as an example, and here's why. Because they're all literal. They name literal nations, they talk about literal attacks coming from other literal nations, and what the outcome is going to be. Okay? What's that symbolic for? Tell me what Gog... I'm, I'm sitting in a Bible study at my church right now, and they're trying to tell me that the Gog Magog invasion is symbolic. What is it symbolic of? Please tell me what's, what's symbolic, because Gog and Magog are actual nations that are written in extra-biblical literature all over the place, and they say one is in the far east of the north, which is North Korea, and the other one is basically where the Mongol Empire came from. 
That's Gog and Magog. It's Korea used to be called Gogoryu, and Mongolia used to be called Magog. Okay? That's it. But these guys will say it's symbolic, and you want to ask them this question. Symbolic for what? And they'll be like, symbolic for nobody can understand this stuff. So that way, when I take you to passages where Jesus told you, let the reader understand, you're like, it's all symbolic. You can't understand. You can call Jesus a liar like I do. He said it would take place before that generation passed away, and it's linked to his coming to do so. Verse 4, let's go back to 20, 24 again. In verse 4, he says, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. So again, the audience there, no one deceives you. He's talking to the disciples. Make sure no one pays attention. No, no one deceives you on this, because some are going to try to deceive you on this. Uh, as just as a side note, history does record false prophets and false kings in those days. There's a Simon bar Giora rose up among the Jews and led a revolt. People called him a king later, and they called him a savior and a guardian, which is interesting. So Jesus says that many people will come in his name saying, I am Christ, I am Christ and deceive many, okay? These guys are going to pull like one example of one guy who claims to be somebody. And we know there were a few of these people running around back then. And he's going to say, oh, all, all of this is going to happen in 70 AD. Tell me, who was the guy that they said was the Messiah in 70 AD? They're not going to tell you because they're going to conflate it with Simon Bar Kokhba, okay? Now, it just so happens that this guy, look, at acclaimed by the people as their savior and guardian, Simon was admitted after the collecting of plunder left in the city by John and he attacked the temple. Hmm. After the collecting plunder left in the city by John, he attacked the temple. Is that, is that many people coming in his name? Saying, I am Christ? Uh, he just says, acclaimed by the people as their savior and guardian. Where does it say that he said, I was Christ? It's not there. These guys are going to take these sparse little examples of guys who do something, and they're going to say, oh, there you go, many, many antichrists. Well, where were these antichrists? Isn't it clear? How come the early church doesn't tell, them, tell us about these guys? Oh, well, Josephus is our authority. Josephus is a Sadducee. He's going to keep citing Josephus. Josephus is a Sadducee, and the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, and they allegorized everything just like the Greeks do, just like Philo of Alexandria, another Levite Sadducee did. Just, just like all the Sadducee sect and just like the early church who, who came up with amillennialism. They get it from Philo of Alexandria, they allegorize everything, and then they deny the resurrection of the dead. That's what Origen did. Okay, That's a heresy, and that's what this guy's doing right here. All these things are supposed to lead up to the destruction of the temple. Again, that's the whole context of the story. When will these things be? When will one stone of the temple not be left upon another? It says, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but the end is not yet. But that is not yet the end. Uh, people love to talk today about how wars are a sign of the end, but there have always been wars. And if, what is Jesus actually saying here? He's saying that wars are not a sign. He says, you're going to be here of wars and rumors of wars. See, you're not frightened. Those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. See, he's going to tell you that wars are not the end, but then he's going to tell you what the, wars, the, the war in 70 AD is the end. Do you see how weird this is? Were there any other wars in Jerusalem other than the one in 70 AD? No, there's this many. How many wars were there between, bet, between Jesus saying this in 70 AD in Jerusalem? This many. This many wars, okay? But Jesus says when you, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, this is not yet the end. Well, he's going to tell you as soon as you see a war, it's the end. The Jewish revolt start in 62. The, 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 uh, the, that's when the wars and the rumors of war start there in Egypt, and then the temple's destroyed. That's the end. He's going to tell you that's the end. He's telling you opposite things. Jesus said that's not the end. There's always been wars. Wars themselves are not a sign. He says, you're going to see wars and rumors of wars. Don't take any heart. That's not the end. Were there instances of wars between 30 AD and 70 AD? And yes, there were wars throughout the Roman Empire. Rome conquered everybody. They started conquering Britain during that time and Armenia also, just to name a couple. Josephus writes that Roman civil wars were so common in the empire that there was no need to write about them in any great detail because he thought they were well known. So wars, again, are not a sign of the end. He says, they're going to be hearing of wars, but wars themselves are not a sign. Verse 7, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. So then that question, were there earthquakes between 30, 80, 30 when Jesus was there and 80, 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed? Josephus is a Roman historian, or not a Roman, well, yeah, he was hired by the Romans, but he was a Jewish historian, and he records the, just the siege of Jerusalem when, when the temple was actually destroyed. All those come from him. And he does record that there were earthquakes so strong that, it, quote, that the constitution of the universe was confounded for the destruction of man. And if you recall, in the Bible, when, when, when Jesus was crucified, it says there was a great earthquake and tombs were opened. So See, why are you citing the earthquakes in 70 AD? You, he just said the earthquakes are not the end. You're saying it is the end. 
You're citing an earthquake when Jesus was crucified and an earthquake in 70 AD as saying, these earthquakes are the end. And then he's saying, Jesus just said they're not the end, but let me cite them as if they are the end. See how he's trying to confuse you? By just just focusing on the Bible. We're not good. We're just going to look at the Bible, except when I cite Josephus, except when I start, cite Stuart, Ru Stuart Russell. We're just going to look at the Bible, right? He's just lying to you. So there was an earthquake at the crucifixion. You remember in Acts, when Paul is in jail, uh, what opens up the doors? You may remember, an earthquake opens the doors. Were there famines in that time? Can we show in the Bible? You go to Acts 11. It says, During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. So here we are right in the Bible, that there were earthquakes and famines that happened after Jesus said these things, just like he said they would. Now, some people will say here at this point, no, there's going to be an increase of frequency of earthquakes, but they're going to have even stronger and stronger earthquakes, and it's going to get worse and worse. But it doesn't actually say that. It just says there's going to be earthquakes and famines. And it's important to note the next verse. It says, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. So this is just the beginning of what's going to be happening. And as these birth pangs come more and more frequently, these things are going to start happening more and more frequently. And it says, then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Did that happen? Well, just read Acts. In Acts, you have Stephen executed. You have James. Paul stoned and left for dead multiple times. History tells us in tradition that... Now, wait a minute. He just told you that you is only talking to his immediate audience. Now he's going to say it's talking about, um, well, James is one of these guys who's killed, but Stephen getting stoned and Paul? He's going to say, oh, it's, it's just about this audience that he's talking to until I want to say you and say it's about Paul and say it's about Stephen. Well, those guys aren't there. Why are, why are you saying, oh, when we want to talk about it's the people who see these signs, you're saying, no, you has to be the people he's talking to. But when I want to say you is about Stephen or about Paul, I can just make it about whoever I want. See, what he's trying to do is restrict you from making it about you because it's to all Jesus' disciples and just say it's just about his immediate, uh, uh, his immediate um, audience and also any examples I can pull together. It's just a double standard. The guy's just deceiving you. The only one that survives all that is John, which is exactly what Jesus would say. We'll look at that a little later. In Acts 8, verse 1, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So here we have, according to the Bible, the, the persecution starts against the saints there. Just like it happened. He said, they're going to put you and hand you over, and they'll hate you because of my name, and that's actually what happened. Some of the opposition to this. Uh, some people have a problem with, in verse 9 there, all nations. They will drive you up to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations because of my name. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but to begin with, Rome is an empire of nations. It was a whole bunch of nations that were part together. You know about the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Uh, was, they conquered somebody and they made you fight for them. And they all were part of their own country, but they were all part of, of Rome. So it was a group of nations. But David also uses the same. So this is what the Preterists are going to do and to interpret the whole world as the, Ro as, as the Roman Empire. Do you know why they say that? because they really believe the whole world is the Roman Empire. These guys are standing under the Roman state religion. They still believe in Christendom. They just believe that the Roman the Roman Empire needs to be retaken over by the Presbyterians and then and then we'll have Christendom again. That's why you hear these Presbyterians and Reformed Baptist people who are derivative of the Presbyterians talking about Christendom 2.0. They really believe they're going to put the Roman Empire back together, okay? Just so you know, Christians, the earliest disciples who talked about the eschaton said the antichrist and his people were going to put the roman empire back together again they all said the roman empire was going to be broken up and then eventually put back together again okay that's what these guys believe that's why they want you to convince when he says oh it's gone out to the roman empire it's gone out to the whole world and they're going to try to put the roman empire back together again because they have the spirit of antichrist okay same type of language all the nations to reply to other things let's look in uh, psalm 118 just briefly in Psalm 118, David's giving uh, thanks for rescuing from the Lord. And it says in verse 10, it says, All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. So all the nations didn't actually surround David at that point. He's just being poetic. Uh, China didn't surround him. No one even knew that was around. Native Americans from America didn't, didn't surround him. All the nations is just a symbolic deal. And again, Roman was, Rome was a whole group of nations anyways. Verse 10, At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. In 2 Timothy, Paul says, let's go to 2 Timothy 2, in 2 Timothy 1, 15, it says, You know that in everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelius and Hermogenes. So even Paul, people turned against Paul. Uh, John talks about those in, uh, let's look at that too. In 1 John 2, 18, it says, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as if you heard the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. Many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But they're 
we're going to show that none of them belong to us. Again, that's okay, pretty much all your commentators believe that um, John's epistles were written in the 80s, AD, after he had moved to Ephesus, okay? Give you a hint. If John's in Ephesus, he's not in Jerusalem. Okay, so he's talking about it. Many antichrists have come, and he's literally talking about the people who say that Jesus didn't come in the flesh among the Greeks in like the 80s or 90s AD. Okay, this is before he writes the book of Revelation, and it's around the time that he writes his gospel. And then in the book of Revelation, he points out the fact that he's the John that wrote the gospel of John. Okay, it's right in the beginning of generation. That's why you want to read. It says, I, the John who testified of Jesus and all the things that he saw, am the one who's writing you this letter. Okay. So he's taking stuff from after the after 70 AD and he's saying, oh, this is before 70 AD now, okay? He's just he's just conflating things. He's just, you know, mixing and matching. He's got these rules that he wants you to follow, but he doesn't follow them himself. That shows again the falling away and betraying one another. Um, verse 11, it says, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Did that happen after Jesus? If you go to 1 John 4, Verse 1, it says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to say whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Again, this is 15, 20 years after 70 AD, so why is he bringing this up? I don't know. Go look up any commentator uh, on when 1 John was written, and they're going to say 70 AD. These, these letters were written so much after 70 AD that some people wondered if they were even not written by the Apostle John, but by the Elder of John, Elder John, who's just one of the 70 elders, okay? So, He's taking stuff that's clearly after 70 AD and say, oh, there you go. There's proof that it's fulfilled in 70 AD, okay? Read your church history and find out when these letters were written for yourselves. This guy's just lying to you. He's just stacking up the lies, you guys. So if John talks about false prophets being around in that day. Verse 12, because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold. Again, if you go to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 says, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. So we know that lawlessness was already around in those days as well. Verse 13, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. What is he talking about here? They ask the end of the age. Was the end? The end of the age. It's not the end of everything. It's not the end of the world, but the end of their current time. He's not talking about being saved from hell, but being preserved while you're alive. Whoever endures to the end will be saved. You'll be saved from it. Up to now, you can, people, you can generally see that all the events up to verse 14 are all things that were just common at the time. But with verse 14 and after that, people say, well, this stuff certainly hasn't happened yet. You get the gospel being preached to the whole world, the abomination of desolation, the sun being darkened, stars falling from heaven, great trumpets. People see all those things and they think, there's no way you can hold that Matthew 24 refers to events that happened back in the past before AD 70. They just seem too big to be so. But, again, verse 34. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened away. I tell you the truth. That's a verily, verily uh, in King James. It will certainly not pass away. These are very, very strong, strong things. I, he's saying it that way because it sounds hard to believe to them, I'm sure. But I tell you the truth, they will certainly not pass away this generation before all these things, all of these things, all the things, and can close the whole chapter, one from chapter one all the way to down to verse one, all the way down to 34. Again, we had the wars in Britain and Armenia. There were famines in Acts 11. We had earthquakes in, in Paul's day, they were freedom from prison. They, they killed James, persecuted Stephen, Paul stoned multiple times. False prophets were around in those days. But then we get verse 14. Verse 14 says, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, then the end will come. People think that, read that and think, there's no way you can tell me that that actually happened. But, believe it or not, the Bible supports that this happened. So let's, again, uh, you may have seen some of my other videos about Greek words. We're going to look briefly at the word for world there. The word there is ukumene. That word means inhabited earth. To give you some context of how that word actually is, if you don't know, uh, you see it's translated as world here, but that has to do with the translation, the translators of the Bible. They think this is a future event, and so they record things this way. But that word ukumene, it actually from, it comes from the Greek, ukos, which means house. And umene, it's, it's actually the places with houses, the inhabited earth, the place where people live. And to give you an idea, uh, let's look to Luke 2, 1 of how that word is used in Scripture. So again, we're using Scripture to interpret Scripture. We're not going to trust necessarily the English definitions here. Let's go to Luke 1, Luke 2. Okay, Luke 2, 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. A lot of versions say the inhabited earth, or, but what's interesting there, the word is for world, entire Roman world, is ukumene again. And again, Rome just taxed itself. That's why inhabited earth is a much better translation. Uh, Caesar didn't tax China or the Native Americans or any of those places. He taxed the Roman Empire. Ukumene was inhabited earth of their day. And this is the same word used in Matthew 24. Why is it in verse Luke 2, 1, they translate it correctly, inhabited earth, but here they put world again. It's the bias of translators again. But the word is ukumene. There is a word for world. It's cosmos. That refers to the whole world. That's not the word being used world here. There are actually four Greek words that sometimes get translated as world. And you can check out my Greek video if you want more information on that. But this is not one of the, this is not cosmos. This is ukumene or inhabited earth. So
Okay, so he's going to take you to this word okumene, and he's going to say, oh, every time they use this word, they just literally mean the Romans. Now, when, uh, yeah, when, when Luke is talking about Caesar Augustus saying that, that all the words, world should be taxed, okay, obviously he's just talking about the Roman Empire because he's talking about something Caesar Augustus said, okay? But, but when Satan shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in, in a moment of time, is he talking about just the Romans? Is he offering Jesus just to be the king of the Romans and that's it? No, okay? So if he's talking about uh, us, the gospel being a witness to all the nations, is he talking about just the Romans? No. What about um, in Acts 21, he says, there's gonna be a dearth throughout all the world which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Well, in that context, he's probably talking about the Roman's world because it came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar, and obviously there was not no food anywhere, but there was a there was a general famine throughout the Roman Empire. When he's talking about um, these guys have turned the world upside down, um, he's he's talking about obviously their immediate civilization. So there, he's just talking about the Jewish world. Okay. When he says that Jesus will judge the world in righteousness, do you think he's only talking about the Romans or only the Jews? Because he's using Okumene there. No, he's talking about everybody. What about Acts 19? Uh, he's saying whom all the, all Asia in the world worships, talking about Diana. Is he talking about the whole world there? Well, no, he's talking about the world of the Greeks who worship Diana. Okay, obviously the whole world doesn't worship Diana, but neither do just the Jews or just the Romans. It's a local cult. Then he says in Romans, he said, their words have gone to the end of the world. Now, he's he, he, this is literally a prophecy he's quoting. And this guy's going to use this one, just so you know. He's going to say, the world's, the, their words have gone to the end of the world, okay? Do you know what he's talking about? He's literally talking about the stars. The stars utter speech and their words go to the end of the world. Okay, is he is he talking about just the Roman world when he says that? No. The stars touch the whole world. The whole world sees the stars, right? He's literally talking about the sun. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. He's talking about the whole in whole, whole earth in that tense. And so this this term, the whole world, this term Okumene, can mean a lot of different things depending on the context, okay? It's, it's generally talking about where humans are, but it could be talking about a culture, it could be talking about an empire, or it could be talking about the whole inhabited, inhabited earth, and you need to get the context, okay? Um, let's see, because you have kept my word from the patience, I will keep you from the hour of temptation that will come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. Is that just talking about the Jews in 70 AD? It's coming on all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. Why wouldn't it just say the Jews? The great devil and Satan who uh, was cast out, who deceives the whole world. Did Satan just deceive the Jews? That's Okumene. Did he just deceive the Roman Empire? That's Okumene. What about when all the kings of the earth come to do battle with the, on the great day of God Almighty? You want to tell me where all the kings of the earth were? All the kings of the whole world. Oh, that's just talking about the Jews in 70 AD fighting Titus. This is absurd. These... these these definitions that he wants you to hold is, is absurd. He's, he's trying to say, oh, if he's going to talk about the whole world, he's only re he, he'll, he would only use the word cosmos. And he's never using the word cosmos to talk about all the people of the world. He's using the cosmos to talk about the created order, the physical earth, the universe, things like that, okay? And then the question then becomes, did the gospel of the kingdom be preached in the whole inhabited earth in the whole Roman Empire as a testimony to all the nations? Well, let's look. Let's go to Colossians 1, 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. The faith and love that springs from the hope that is stored up from in you in heaven and that you already have heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood. So we have the gospel going out into all the world, and let's keep going in verse 20. He didn't say the gospel is preached through all the world through, for, for um, a testimony to all the generations. He's saying it's gone throughout the world. What does that mean? It means it's spreading throughout the world. 
It doesn't mean it's been preached in the whole world. 21, scroll down a little bit here. It says, once you were alienated from, alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has been reconciled to you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm, not move from the hope that is held in the gospel. This is the gospel you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So here in Colossians, it says that the gospel had been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. That's obviously uh, hyperbole, but he, it still shows that it went out. And that's what was happening. Paul traveled all over and brought the gospel to all the nations. Uh, a lot of people and commentators will agree up to this point again. But they say, again, we're starting with, I can see where you can say all these other ones are referring to uh, time in their day. Verse 15, it says it jumps to the future. So they think there's a break here. So let's read verse 15. It says, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. People today are, are relatively, they say they're certain that this hasn't happened yet. But again, we have verse 34 that says it had to have happened before this generation passed away. This is one of those things. And again, who's he talking? Now, do you see how he's getting you to use circular reasoning to eisegete verse 34, which he, he just spent a half hour prepping you up to think, you, you got to skip, you got to skip everything he says up to verse 34, and then get up to verse 34, and then go eisegete everything in through what I tell you about Josephus and Bertrand Russell, and all the commentaries that I've read that all agree, which if he, if he really believes all the commentaries agree on this, He's only read Preterist commentaries. He's only read commentaries pretty much that were written in the late 19th and early 20th century. Because that's all the commentators that are going to commentate on, on Preterism, okay? And he's claiming that everybody believes this. And you should too. Now, there are tons of people throughout church history that, that, that tell you that this hasn't happened yet. Because they all know it's going to be the last thing that happened before Christ's coming. The Antichrist will come before Christ's coming. That's a consistent teaching throughout church history. Everybody believes it. The Roman Catholics believe it. The Greek Orthodox believe it. The Protestants believe it. They just try to say it was the Pope. Everybody believed this until the Preterists in the late 19th century tried to be their way out of admitting what the entire church believed before them. Now, why is he trying to get you to do this, okay? Now, he just tells you it's in Daniel. Go read and understand. Is he going to take you to Daniel? Let's see talking to here so when you see standing in the holy place is he talking to you the reader out here in, in 2017 no he's talking to the disciples so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken to the prophet daniel let the reader understand then let those who judea flee to the mountains some people say the you is talking to somebody else you know you have to let the reader understand right but look what is the abomination uh the abomination of desolation if we can identify that then we know about when it could have been and all those sorts of things now, notice he wants to say that you is just the audience he's talking to, unless he wants to make it about Paul or Stephen. Then he'll make it about them, okay? But when he wants to wrangle it down to just the audience he's talking to, now, I would like to ask then, out of James, Peter, Paul, and John, the only four people he's talking to, which one of them saw the abomination of desolation in the temple? The answer is this many, unless you count John seeing it in a vision in the book of Revelation. Because three of, three of the four of them were dead by then. And John's the only one that's left, and he's in Ephesus. And that's why this guy is reading letters he's writing to Ephesus and claiming these are before 70 AD. Well, if John's in Ephesus, how, he's, how is he seeing the abomination of desolation standing in the temple? The answer is, you need to go to Daniel to understand that, and you need to understand that the 70th week is in the future. But he's not going to take you to Daniel, nor is he going to take you to uh, Paul in 2 Thessalonians, because I put those right in front of his face, and he said he's not going to read them. Uh, nobody knows for absolute certainty in all, in all disclosure of what the abomination is, but there are certain things we certainly do know. Uh, Luke 21 is the mirror passage for this. This is the same story told differently. So let's look and see what that says there. Luke 21. You yeah, have the same thing. Wars, rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against earthquakes, earthquakes, famines, lay hands on you, persecute you. We get down to verse 20. Well, this is a spot talking about the abomination of desolation. Instead, in verse 20, it says, When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So here it doesn't mention specifically as being from Daniel, but it says, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, then flee to the mountains, which is exactly what it says in verse 16. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Exact same thing. Notice how he says it's the exact same thing when it's not the exact same thing. He just read to you and says, it doesn't say read Daniel here. And then he goes on to say it's the exact same thing. It says the exact same thing. You just said two opposite things. You said it says something different, and then you said it says the exact same thing. Do you see how he's got these beer goggles on? And he's just like, oh, that's new information that my brain just doesn't want to see. I'm going to pretend the words uh, abomination is there. I'm going to pretend the words temple are there, and I'm going to pretend the words Daniel are there so I can say it's the exact same thing. 
even after saying it doesn't say what the other one said, but it says the exact same thing. He's going to hold the two verses side by side, and it's like, gee, one's twice the size of the other one. They say the exact same thing. No, it doesn't. This says when you see Jerusalem sh surrounding by armies, its desolation is near. Notice he says its desolation. Who? What's desolation? Jerusalem's desolation, okay? The destruction of Jerusalem is the subject of Luke 21. And if you go read Luke 21, he's going to give that speech before he goes to the Mount of Olives. So you go to Luke 21. This guy's just a liar. He's just a bullcrap artist to the to the umpteenth. You go to Luke 21. Well, I know the Greek, though. I know so nobody should listen to you because I know the Greek, okay? Well, you just showed you don't know the definition of Greek words and how they're used in the context of Scripture. So I guess you're just full of crap. But let's see. Uh, Luke 21. What does he say at the end of Luke 21? And in the daytime he was teaching the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. Wait a minute. Matthew 24 starts off in the Mount of Olives. That's at the end of Luke 21. Yeah, because at it, Luke 21 he says... Um, it, and some have spoken in the temple how it was adorned with gifts. And he said, as for these things which you behold, so they're right in the temple looking at them, the days will come when there shall not be one stone left upon another thrown down. And they asked him, notice they didn't say, and, and that night they were sitting on the Mount of Olives and they asked him, this is right after he says this. Notice he's, he's going to say something very different here. Some of this stuff is not in Matthew 24, and there's a ton of stuff in Matthew 24 and 25 that's not in this. They're two different dialogues. And they're going to cover some of this stuff in Matthew 24, but a lot of it is different. They're going to pull stuff from Luke 17, stuff from Luke 12. They're going to pull, pull stuff from, I think, like Luke 23. Bunch of stuff they're going to pull into Matthew 24 and 25 that's not here. Okay, And then when you get to this, notice he's going to say, When you see Jerusalem compassed by armies, then you know that the desolation thereof is near. What? The desolation of Jerusalem. He doesn't say the abomination of desolation. He doesn't say anything about the temple. Why? Because that's something different. Now, if you know your scripture, you know that when Jerusalem was destroyed under, under Nebuchadnezzar, they called that an, a, a, a desolation. Okay? The destruction of a city is one kind of desolation. But Daniel is going to write after Jerusalem is destroyed, and he's going to prophesy about the abomination of desolation way in the future. And then Jesus is going to tell you that's in the future. Okay, so you have literally in the Old Testament in Jeremiah, you're going to have desolation referring to the destruction of the city and abomination of desolation referring to a man standing in the temple claiming he's God. And Paul is going to make that clear distinction. This guy's not going to read Paul. He's not going to read Daniel. He's going to disobey Christ and he's going to go listen to J. Stuart Russell instead. Or yeah, J. Stuart Russell. And then um, who's the other guy? Um, Bertrand Russell. He must like guys named Russell. Okay, J. Stuart Russell is the guy he gets his stuff from. So he's going to listen to an atheist, he's going to listen to a Sadducee, and he's going to listen to a preterist. But you know who he's not going to listen to? Jesus or Paul. He's too smart to listen to those guys. Could he, he knows Greek better than all the guys who wrote in Greek. Okay, Captain Brilliant, let's hear what else. Yeah, flee to the mountains. So here it doesn't mention specifically as being from Daniel, but it says when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, then flee to the mountains, which is exactly what it says in verse 16. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Exact same thing. So when is Jerusalem surrounded by armies? Most certainly. Actually, they, that's how the Romans finally ended up beating them. They surrounded Jerusalem and starved them out. They literally surrounded them. That would, they would have seen that as an exact fulfillment of what Jesus said. Uh, so the abomination, again, I'm not sure what exactly that's referring to. Some people say it was just the act of the army surrounding Jerusalem. That's one way they see it. Some say it was the Jewish dissenters. There were zealots in, in Jerusalem who had controlled the city and they were, they were killing people in the temple area, which would have been a holy place. That's the spot where Jesus was overturning tables. And they were actually killing, bloody, blood, killing them there. The bloodletting maybe was abomination. And some people talk about the eagle standards. Eagles were an unclean bird, and uh, they, all the Roman insignias had eagles on them, and they were all inside the temple area, and they, some people say that's the abomination. We don't know exactly what it is, but we do know when it was. It was going to be when the Jerusalem was surrounded by armies. So how could it be the uh, eagles insignias in the temple when Jerusalem is surrounded by armies? How are they outside of the city and inside of the city at the same time? That doesn't seem like it would happen like that. Also, it doesn't seem like they would have time to flee if these guys are already in the temple with their, with their insignias. Let's think about that. Why is he saying this? Because these are two different things and he's smushing them together. Well, he's saying, you, you, who knows what the abomination of desolation is? Well, I'll tell you who knows. People who've gone and studied Daniel. Because that's what Jesus tells you to do. 
Why don't you do what Jesus tells you to do and go to study Daniel? Why don't you even open and turn a page to Daniel? Why don't you even try to make up some BS about Daniel? Nope, nope, nobody can really know. It's this thing or that thing or this thing or that thing, but anything but what the Bible says it is in Daniel and Paul quoting Daniel, okay? We have a word abomination used all over in scripture. It refers to false gods, uh, Deuteronomy 7.25, uh, Nadab and Abihu brought strange fire. It was said to be an abomination. What do you do with abominations? You burn them. That's what happened. Uh, you burn the abominations. And that's what happened in Jerusalem after they broke in finally. Uh, they burned the temple to the ground. Uh, some people protest here that it has to be a worldwide thing. Uh, but it doesn't have to be worldwide because all you got to do to escape this is flee to the mountains around Judea. If it was a worldwide thing, fleeing to the mountains of Judea would not help you uh, from escaping you know, the comets or nuclear war or whatever. Okay. He's saying those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. He's not saying the whole world flee to the mountains. He's saying that's what the Jews in Judea need to do to be protected, okay? Now, if you listen to any of my commentary in the book of Revelation, that's because the Jews are going to run to Basra. They're going to be protected there, and then Jesus is going to come down. He's going to get his robes coated with blood by fighting around Basra, okay? As for the rest of the world, we're either going to get raptured, get our heads chopped off for not taking the mark of the beast, or go to hell for taking the mark of the beast. That's what's going to happen, okay? But the Jews are a special case. Those believing Jews get to flee to Basra in the mountains because God has blinded them in part on purpose, and they've had a pretty rough go at the last 2,000 years. And so God's going to cut them a little break and say, if you run to Basra, I will save you, okay? Now, he's going to say, well, wait a minute. If it's a worldwide thing, why would they run to Basra? Why would they run to the mountains? Because Jesus said to run to the mountains if you're in Judea. If you're fleeing the city, where are you going to run? Yes, you can flee the city in the end times. Yes, Revelation 12 is talking about the Jews fleeing the city in the end times. Then it talks about Satan being cast down from heaven. Then it talks about the earth being harvested. Then it talks about an image being set up in the temple and people being made to worship it and take the mark of the beast. Yeah, all that stuff's in the book of Revelation. It describes everything. You're like, who knows? You know, burning. We know that abominations get burned. Something about idols. I, I don't know. Who can possibly know what abomination means? I don't know. Why don't you go study Daniel? No, I don't want to listen to Jesus. Okay. But Jesus told these things, them these things, so they would get out. You're going to hear wars, rumors of wars. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. When you see standing in the holy place, abomination that causes desolation, then, then flee to the mountains around Judea. And Josephus records that some did survive in the, in the mountains, in the caves uh, around Jerusalem. So... Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, where's the holy place? It's in the temple. It's literally in the holy of holies. What's abomination of desolation standing in the holy place? Well, Paul says it's the man standing in the temple claiming that he's God. And John says it's going to be an image in the temple after that man is struck down by the Lord's appearing. So it's both of those things. Okay. Why do you think it's Jerusalem surrounded by armies? He just said, standing in the holy place. How are you going to get surrounded by armies out of standing in the holy place? Well, because I don't know. I, let me tell you everything I know about the original Greek. If you knew the original Greek, that standing in the holy place means outside the city. Because that's the holy place. Let's go on to the next, next verse, verse 17. Let no one on the housetop go back to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequal to the beginning of the world until now, and never be equaled again. So here you have, again, types of things we don't have today. Let no one on the housetop go back down to take anything out of the house. When's the last time you were on top of your house? Uh, we don't have that. In those days, they had flat roofs. That's describing a time when they would be on the house. If you remember in, in, when they hid the spies, uh, Rahab, in the Old Testament, they went on the roof where there was a, a pile of hay or something. They hid him there. And so, and again, let no one in the field go back and get their cloak. That's The field is talking about working out in the field. It's talking about agrarian society. When's the last time any of us were out working in the field? Uh, talking about winter or on the Sabbath. We don't honor the Sabbath here in today's day. What's the first thing? You remember in Acts. For those of you that aren't completely retarded, these are all pictures of Jews working in the fields today. Okay, this is, these are literally in Israel. These guys have all kinds of crops. They have tons of farming that goes on, okay? And yes, these are Jews working in the farm fields in Israel, okay? Well, we don't work in the farms today. Where could it, how could anybody be in the fields in Judea? Right, they all just get their food from Walmart, right? I don't know if you know this, dude, but food doesn't come from the store. It just goes in the store so people who don't know how to farm can buy some. 
holy crap is this stupid. We don't go to the farms today. We don't work in the fields today, unless you're a Jew working in the fields in Judea. <laughs> and he says, who, what's the context? Remember, let's listen to the audience in the context. Those who are in Judea working in the fields. Well, nobody works in the fields nowadays except for the pictures of the people working in the fields, stupid. Oh my gosh, I'm losing my patience with this dude. Uh, the disciples were, it said they were, had, they were doing, they were selling their land and they would put their money for the common use. And why would they sell their land? They sell their land because they weren't going to have it anymore. They were going to be fleeing out from them, from, from the whole area. And so they sold their land now because it was going to be worthless later on. And so that's the first thing they did was sell their land. Some didn't listen though. Uh, one million Jews were killed during the siege in, in, in 70 AD. And many were taken and left as slaves. And again, let's go here, let's look at the part where it says, unequal from the beginning of the world. That word, their world is cosmos for the world. The first temple. Um, Ezekiel 5, 9. Let's look, look about the first temple. Ezekiel 5 is talking about the destruction of the first temple that was destroyed. And let's look at verse 9. Because of all your detestable idols, I will do to you what I have never done before and will never do again. He did burn the temple down again. So I mean, it's, it's just a, 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 a use of language to say how it's an apocalyptic scenario. It's not really the worst thing in the, world, in the whole world because if that were the case, uh, the, the flood would have been worse than anything that you can imagine because every single creature on the earth except for Noah and his family died. So there's nothing that compares to the flood. Only eight people survived that. But in terms no, actually, the tribulation on the Jews is going to be worse than 70 AD. And the reason is, is because in Zechariah, it actually describes it. It says two out of every three Jews are going to be dead. Okay, it's going to, they're going to kill two-thirds of all the Jews in the last day. You want to read uh, Zechariah 12 through 14, okay? It tells you it's a last day's prophecy leading up to Jesus coming, standing on the Mount of Olives, splitting the mountain, splitting the city, lead, get, going getting all his people from Basra, and then he's going to go fight, the, fight, fight all the world, and then everyone's going to come and worship in Jer Jerusalem. Yeah, that didn't happen in 70 AD either, okay? So it's going to be worse than anything that's ever happened to the Jews, okay? It's a time of great tribulation for the Jews. In terms of the history of the Jews, everything that happened in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant nation, nothing compared to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Verse 22, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Some people say, yeah, see here, it has to be global or all, life will, all the life would end. Uh, it's interesting about Greek. In Greek, it actually says all flesh. No, no flesh would survive. Um, but all doesn't always necessarily mean all again. This is just very extreme language. And for some examples, let's look at Mark chapter 1, verse 5. This is talking about Jesus again. It says, The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to see him. All the people of Jerusalem? All of Jerusalem went to see him? No, not all of Jerusalem went to see him. It's just saying all types of people, all kinds of people went out to see him. It's just a way we use language. It happens all the time. Now, notice how he makes things hyperbole whenever he wants to, and then he makes it really super, super specific whenever he wants to. And then he'll say, you is only talking to the apostles here. And then it's talking about Peter and John here. And Antichrist are only talking about Antichrist that the apostles see here before 70 AD. But then over here, it's talking about John with these Antichrists after 70 AD. Notice how he just has this selective interpretation. And what the interpretation is, is this. The real rule, the only rule he ever uses is, Whatever makes my interpretation work, that's the rule, okay? And what's his interpretation? Ignore what Jesus said and just read J. Stuart Russell, okay? John 12, 12, 19 says, So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And again, they're just, they're just being dramatic, and that's just how we use language. We do that today. We say it's raining cats and dogs. We don't literally think it's raining cats and dogs. One more, Acts 2. Do you see how he just negates Christ's second coming? Ah! I know it says every eye will see him. I know he says he's going to judge the whole world, but he's just being dramatic. Christ is just being dramatic when he talks about the whole world. He's not really going to judge everybody. What he's really going to do is tell us to go judge people ourselves. And we can go be racist, and we can enslave them, and we can colonize them, and we can do all this stupid stuff in our own name because we're establishing the kingdom. See, that's the people who he follows. The people who actually promoted slavery and colonialism and all this stuff in the name of Jesus. 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice to address the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour my spirit out on all people. Again, it wasn't all people. It was only these people that were right there who were prophesying. A lot of them weren't doing it and they thought it was weird. God wasn't just pouring out his spirit, spirit only on the priesthood. That's what it means. Not only on the priest or the prophets, but on all mankind. These were regular fishermen who had their spirit poured out upon them and then they were prophesying. It's all kinds of people, not all, all. Verse 23, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. 
Again, did this happen? I, I told you about the false prophets already, and some who said they were called the false savior. Verse 25, see. What were the great signs that those false prophets performed to deceive, if possible, even the elect? Great signs, miracles, apparently. Because uh, Paul says uh, Satan's going to perform all these lying signs and wonders. What were those lying signs and wonders? Were those the magic tricks that Simon the sorcerer was doing that deceived nobody? That are so, so powerful they could deceive even the very elect. What were those signs? Oh, we'll just blow over that part. It's not that important. I have told you ahead of time. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the disciples. Verse 26. So if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or here he is, in the inner rooms, do not believe it. In other words, that's not the way he comes. It was a judgment coming of the Messiah. He wasn't coming to save, but he was coming to judge. It wasn't a physical coming of a single person. That you had to go out and see him and look at him. You'll see in the very next verse what the verse is like, what the coming is like. But he says, if anybody tells you, there he is, he's over here, he's over there, don't believe him. Why? Because that's not how the Messiah comes. Notice he said Jesus isn't coming to save, he's just coming to judge. Uh, wait a minute, didn't he just say him? they who endure to the end will be saved? Um, he's not coming to save, but to judge? Oh, he's going to gather his elect. Oh, that's not saving them. Watch how he BSs his way through that. He doesn't come in that way. How does he come? Verse 27. For as lightning that comes out of the east is visible even in the west, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Lightning is often mentioned as judgment in the Old Testament, lots of times. A lot of people think that this is when he raptures everybody up to heaven, but that's not the way the Bible uses coming. It's a term of judgment. Uh, let's look at Revelation 2 here just briefly. I don't want to go too much into Revelation um, at this point anyways. In, verse, in chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, then I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Did Jesus actually going to come and remove your lampstand? Come down to that church he was talking about? No, it wasn't a literal coming. He doesn't come in that way. Uh, some people think, see, it's got to be worldwide because as lightning flashes in the east, it's visible even in the west. So everybody, it's going to be, the whole world's going to see this at the same time. But that's, again, not true if you even think about it for very long. If it's lightning over here in Wyoming, it, do you guys see it wherever you are? No. Lightning is not a global thing. Uh, it's just trying to show you that everybody's going to notice when this happens. Verse 28. Jesus literally says, every eye will see him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. That's not everybody. Jesus uses metaphors as an example. As it shines in one part of heaven and is seen in the other part, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And then he says, everyone will see him. That's not, that's just loose language. Jesus is just being dramatic. He doesn't really mean anything that he says. He's not really coming. That's what he's telling you. Jesus is not really coming. He already came in 70 AD. We shouldn't even be looking for Jesus in the second coming. That's a heresy by every Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant standard that ever exists before 1875. Every single one of them. If you don't believe in a literal second coming of Jesus coming in the clouds, you're not a Christian. You're just not a Christian. I don't know what to tell you. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Uh, vultures, again, uh, the translation there is interesting. Uh, it could be read as eagles, which is interesting. Wherever there's a carcass that the eagles will gather, that would definitely be referring to the Roman Empire. But no telling. Again, you have the audience relevance. Who's he talking about here? Uh, people say, some people, just like in verse 14, uh, they say time jumps. Uh, some people will still agree all the way up to here, but they'll say after the next verse, after verse 28, uh, it's going to go to the future now. And that's, again, we're still stuck with verse 34. I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. It's still, we're still well within those verses. You see how it keeps coming back to verse 34? Like, you have to start with Matthew 24, and you have to skip all the way to thir verse 34, and then read everything through verse 34 based on my particular interpretation of verse 34. No, who knows what the abomination of desolation says? Who knows what Christ coming in the cloud looks like? Who knows what eagles and carcasses are? Now, he knows the Greek, and he knows aitos only means eagles and never means vultures. Absolutely zero time does it mean vultures. Because the word orneo means vultures and the word itos means eagles, okay? He knows he's got bad translations because he knows the Greek. But it, you don't need to figure out what eagles and carcasses means because right after that he talks about Christ sending out his angels to gather his elect. And Paul explains that as a resurrection of the dead carcasses and those who are alive are caught up with them in the clouds. And in First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, he's not going to read First Thessalonians chapter 4. He's also not going to read Daniel that Christ told you to read. Why? Because Daniel says right here in chapter 12, the same chapter that mentions the from the time the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up. Remember the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place? He says, this is the same chapter that says this, says, at that time, Michael will stand up, the great prince of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, 
even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Remember, he said Jesus is coming to judge, not to save. No, it says they're going to be delivered. That means saved. Everyone that is found written in the book, and many of them that sleep in the dusty earth, shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and contempt. And they that be wise shall shine like brightness in the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness like the stars forever. That's described in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul describes how our bodies are going to be transformed like stars. This is described in Revelation 11 in 1 Thessalonians. This is also described in 1 Thessalonians. And this part right here is described in 2 Thessalonians. Paul describes these things. This is everything you need to know, and he gets it right from Matthew 24, obeys Jesus, unlike this idiot, and goes and reads Daniel, and comes up with his conclusion, which he puts in Corinthians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Okay, so we know all this even without the book of Revelation. Okay, just by obeying Christ and reading Daniel, but he doesn't obey Christ. He's like, who can know what Christ meant? Everything, Christ was just being dramatic. He was just a bit of a you know, drama queen, and he just, he just said crazy things that you shouldn't take literally, because he's an idiot. I'm smart, but Jesus is an idiot. That's what he thinks, okay? Verse 29. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and heavenly bodies will be shaken. Uh, so first we have immediately. This happens immediately after the distress of those days. So there can't be a time jump because it's immediately is immediately. If up to verse 28 was happening in the past, this is right after that. And people see this, this language, it's a, a huge language, and they say, how can you say this takes place already? The stars are going to fall and heavenly bodies are going to be shaken. The sun's going to be darkened. And again, we have verse 34. I didn't say it was going to take place. Jesus said this was going to take place before that generation passed away. But what's interesting, it sounds really apocalyptic, but if you knew anything about prophecy and you were familiar with the Bible in their day, they would have known what that meant. He's actually quoting Old Testament, Babylon, and applying it to the present day Israel. It's a very Old Testament, common Old Testament phrase. It's also not uncommon to apply sun, moon, and stars to nations. You think today well, how a lot of our flags, how they represented sun, moon, and stars are a very common uh, symbol. That's not a proof, that's just, that's just showing. Okay, do you notice how he doesn't take you to any of these Old Testament prophets that they talk about the sun and, and turning to darkness? Do you know why? Because the context of every single one of them is the end of the world. Go to Joel 3, go to Joel 2, go to Isaiah 24, go to Isaiah, um, I think Isaiah 3. Okay, the context is always the end of the world. None of these passages are about Nebuchadnezzar coming. They're in Isaiah and Joel, and Isaiah and Joel were hundreds of years before, or like like 150 years before Nebuchadnezzar, okay? He doesn't talk about the sun turning into darkness in Jeremiah. He doesn't talk about the sun turning into darkness in Habakkuk. He doesn't talk about the sun turning into darkness in, in uh, Zephaniah. Those things aren't there. They're only in prophecies that are about the end of the world. Now look, listen to this. Notice he's just like, when you see those days, you're supposed to refer to, jump ahead to verse 34 to get the context of that. Does anybody read like that? No. Nobody starts reading a passage, jumps halfway through this. Just so you know, verse 34 is not even halfway through it, okay? You still got all of this being said in, in chapter 25, okay? Why does he just skip like 40% into it? So he can eisegete what this one line from 40% into it. See, this is where all these preterists, when I point out, yeah, they all just talk about this generation dictating everything, and they don't believe that they do this. But I'm showing you a guy who keeps bringing you to this generation, this generation, this generation, when he literally talks about, remember, this generation, these things, okay? Now, before he says these things, he says, those days shall be shortened, um, woe to them who give suck in those days. Those days shall be shortened. Um, and then immediately after the tribulation of those days. He keeps referencing this future time after the abomination of desolation. Now, he doesn't know what the abomination of desolation is. He can't tell you what it is because he won't read Daniel, which is what Christ told you to do. Now, I'm showing you how Paul did all the homework for you already. He goes to Daniel 12. He literally goes to Daniel 12. Where it literally says, And from that time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination of desolation that is set up there shall be 1,290 days. What is that? Oh, that's half of a week. That's half of Daniel's 70th week. Okay? 
And then he just looks at the passage and he says, at that time, Michael the great prince will stand for the people and there shall be a time of trouble that is, has not been since there's a nation, uh, even until that time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Remember how you said Jesus came to judge, not to save? No, nope. at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Who's everyone that's found written in the book? That's the great, great white throne judgment. That's, what, that's everyone who's found written in the book. Now listen to this. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Oh, uh, what is eagles grabbing carcasses meaning? Jesus tells you. He says it's the angels going to grab his children from throughout the earth. He says the elect, right? Many of them that sleep in the dust shall the earth, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and contempt, okay? There's a thousand year gap between these two things. But the everlasting life ones happen at that time. When's that, that time? It's the same time the abomination of desolation is set up, okay? Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. And he says, those that are wise shall shine in the brightness of the firmament. The wise are who? Those that turn many to righteousness. That will shine like the stars forever. Who's that? Those are the Christians that are spreading the gospel. Okay? Paul is going to talk about this in 1 Corinthians 15. It's the resurrection of the dead. And at the resurrection of the dead, he's going to set out his angels to gather his elect. That's the rapture. Paul is going to describe all this stuff in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because he knows that's where the abomination of desolation is. He's just listening to Jesus. And this guy is not. Isaiah 13, though. Let's go back to Isaiah 13. Wail for the day of the Lord. Do you notice how often he goes to the Old Testament but never to Daniel? Isn't that odd? The Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Every man's heart will melt. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look against each other, their faces aflame. See, a day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day, with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners with it. The stars of heaven and their constellation will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. So here we have a very, very similar thing, a very apocalyptic. Hearts melting, terror is going to seize them, uh, make the land desolate, destroy all the sinners. Uh, stars are not going to give their light. The sun's going to be darkened, the moon's not going to give its light. These are the exact same kind of language. But it was referring to, to Old Testament Babylon being destroyed. It wasn't talking about literally, the, the stars literally stop shining, and the moon literally stop shining. No, it did. It's, it's a very common phrase. Uh, and again, 24, you get the woman in labor. That prophecy wasn't talking about Old Testament Babylon being destroyed. Old Testament, ba Old Testament Babylon was not even a major power back then. Isaiah wrote that during the peak of, of, of the Assyrian Empire. The Babylonian Empire hadn't really risen yet. He's talking about last day's mystery Babylon, which, which is in the Book of Revelation. Israel is also shown in prophetic ways to be the sun, moon, and the stars. You remember Joseph's dream in the Old Testament? Genesis 37, 9 and 10. Well, let's just read it. Then he had another dream. He told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And he told his father as well as his brothers. said, Father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come to the bow down ground before you? So this is, again, sun, moon, and stars in this case. It again referred to Israel. It was the sun was the, the, the was his dad, and his, mother, his mom was the moon, and his brothers were the stars. And that's, again, Israel today. That is Israel. Jacob was renamed Israel. And so sun, moon, and stars uh, refers to it that way. Let's look at Revelation. He's going to say the sun, moon, and stars refer to Israel. Always? Do always the sun, moon, and stars refer to Israel? Because in Revelation 12, there's a woman clothed with the sun with 12 stars above her head and the moon's under her feet, and she flees Jerusalem. Go figure. At the same time, Satan is cast out of heaven, and a child is caught up, harpazoed, raptured, up into the sky to rule the earth. It's the body of Christ being caught up to heaven. Okay? He doesn't get any of that language. He's going to say metaphors are literal, and the literal is metaphors until the very end. Okay, that's all he's going to do. He's just going to reverse the meaning of every single thing until he gets Jesus is coming back means Jesus is not coming back. 12. Revelation 12, 1, it says, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. And again, we're not, thinking, we're not waiting for a real woman to be clothed with the sun, stand on the moon, and have 12 stars. It's again, we're borrowing that language from the Old Testament of Joseph's dream of sun, moon, and stars being Israel. Let's look at Ezekiel 32. Ezekiel 32, it's a lament for Pharaoh. In verse 7, it says, When I snuff you out, I will cover the heavens and darken the stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon will not give its light. All the shining lights in the heaven I will darken over you and bring darkness over your land, declares the Sovereign Lord. So those, again, that didn't really happen in his day. Sun, moon, and stars is just a figurative way. One more, one more. Joel 3, 3, 15, it says, The sun and moon will be darkened, and the stars will no longer shine. And that's referring to just the judgment of the nations. So Joel 3 is referring to Armageddon. It literally talks about everyone coming up to Jerusalem and worshiping Jesus after that. When did that happen in 70 AD? I love, love how, look at, he's going to all the Old Testament passages he can think of and taking them out of context, 
but he's not going to the one that Jesus tells you to go to. Why? Well, look at Joel 3. Let's just look at Joel 3, okay? Uh, behold, in those days and that time, I'll bring forth the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. They're coming back from captivity, okay? I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. All nations. I will plead with them there for my people and my heritage Israel. Look at what he says there. He says, listen, but Judah will dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. Yeah, that's about the destruction of Jerusalem. It's literally talking about the restoration of Jerusalem. Look at the sun will be darkened and the moon shall withdraw our science. The Lord will roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake and the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy and there shall be no strangers pass through her anymore. And it shall come to pass in that day that the uh, mountain shall drop with new wine and the hill shall flow with uh, milk and the river of Judah shall flow with waters. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shittim. This is all in Ezekiel 40 through 48. This is in uh, Zechariah 14. This is literally, look at Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their own land. And Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. Well, gee, he's destroyed Judah twice since this prophecy was given. So this would be really stupid if it was talking about Jerusalem dwelling forever from generation to generation after this prophecy is given, okay? Because it's not talking about the immediate generation. It's not talking about Babylon. It's not talking about Assyria. It's talking about Armageddon. And this guy just, again, how can he look up 50,000 Old Testament prophecies and never go to Daniel, which is what the Lord says to do? So again, remember the question. The question is? The answer is because he doesn't follow the Lord. When will the temple be destroyed? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And it can't be real stars anyways, because if a real star actually fell to earth, we would all be burned up, right? So you have to make stars be meteors, and then you have a, you know, it turns into all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, sun, moon, and stars is a common phrase in the Old Testament. And Just so you know, in the Bible, they commonly use the word star or aster for meteors, okay? Now, I want you to know where he's going with this, okay? It's not literal, it's not literal, it's not literal, it's not literal, it's not literal. What is he telling you? I'm telling you what he's telling you, just so you know. I love his motif here, okay? It just literally looks like the devil in hell, okay? Don't look for Christ coming. He's not coming. Christ isn't coming. That's what he's telling you. You're stupid if you think Christ is coming. How are we ever going to convince the atheists if we think Christ is literally coming? That's where he's going with all this. And they would have understood that immediately. You also then have... Uh, heaven shaken. It says the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Uh, I think it's important to, to look at that real briefly. In Hebrews 12, in verse 26, 12, 26, it says, At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may be remain. So there is a, there's a shaking that happens as well. Okay, verse 30. At that time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So this, this is another big one. People think, man, there's no way you can tell me that this has already happened. It's, it's, it's too apocalyptic. It's too huge. Jesus coming to earth, a second coming. But again, we have verse 34. Verse 34 says all these things. This is one of those things. So we have to figure out what he was meaning by this. We've already uh, talked about how coming can appear and is just a coming in judgment. We have some translation issues again here, just like we did before. It says the, tr the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. That word there, sky, verse 30, is udonos. That word is udonos. That means heaven. It's the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. It's not in the sky. Uh, it's funny that they love to translate those words wrong, just like the word for world and land, they love to translate sky. But there's only one word for sky, again you can reference my Greek video for more about that. But the word is more properly heaven. And then you have all the nations, well... Yeah. Okay, don't reference this guy's Greek video. The word for the word for Oranos is used for all the heavens. It's used for the heaven where the angels dwell, it's used for the space where the stars are, and it's used for the heaven where the birds fly, okay? Just go to, just go to Genesis. And just look at what it, it's going to use the same word in the in in the um, in the Hebrew for heaven for where the birds are, and the same word for where the stars are, and the same word for where the angels are, and it's the same thing in the New Testament. There's only one word for heaven. That's why Paul describes the third heaven. So you can distinguish between the first heaven where the birds dwell, the second heaven where the stars are, and the third heaven where the angels are. And he says he got caught up to the third heaven. Okay, this guy's going to tell you there's only one word for sky. Okay, all the Bible translators are wrong. All the Bible translators are wrong because this guy's got a Greek video. He's such an expert, okay? What he is is a devil. He's a liar, okay? The word there, nations, is what NIV, but the word there is tribes. The tribes of the earth. 
And that earth there again is just like the same word we talked about earlier. It's not cosmos, it's land, the tribes of the land. Who are the tribes of the land? That's the 12 tribes. The 12 tribes are going to mourn. And they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. He's coming to destroy the temple. And that's going to make them all very sad. And they do mourn. There's a whole, a whole set of poems called the Sibylline Oracles where they just lament and wail and mourn for the destruction of the temple over and over again. The bottom line. Do you see? Now, if you guys watch my Christendom series, did you hear him just reference the Sibylline Oracles as a source? Notice where he is going. Jesus says, go to Daniel. He goes to Josephus. He goes to um, Bertrand Russell. He goes to um, the Sibylline Oracles, the demonic Greek Oracles. Well, there's my there's my proof right there. The Sadducee, the, Ace, the, the Sadducee that doesn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, the atheist who doesn't believe in God, and the Sibylline Oracles who are demon, demonically inspired. Those are, those are my proofs, okay? But don't worry, we're just gonna stick to the Bible here. Liar. It is very sad, and they do mourn. There's a whole, a whole set of poems called the Sibylline Oracles where they just lament and wail and mourn for the destruction of the temple over and over again. The bottom line is verse 34 says that it had to have happened already. But again, this isn't a, this isn't a giant of the earth appearing in the sky. It is the tribes of the land mourning when he appears, the sign of the Son of Man appears in heaven. Verse 31. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Again, the word sky here is actually heaven. Some people see this verse as God literally sending angels that take the Jews, pick them up from all over the place, and drop them off in Jerusalem, and it's going to have a thousand-year reign there. So that word angel there is the Greek word angelos, and it just means messenger. The, most of the time, or a lot of the time, rather, when angelos is used, it is referring to God's messengers, which is who we call angels. Uh, but in English, we have ripped that word out, angelos, and made the word angel, and made it be only God's messengers. For instance, John the Baptist is actually referred to as an angelos in Scripture when it says that I will send my messenger ahead of you to prepare your way for you. That's what he said about himself. The word there is used as angelos, uh, but he's not actually an angel. It's just the word for messenger. So if you read that the correct way, he will send forth his messengers with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. So just so you know, based on his interpretation, every time you see the word angelos, don't ever think angels because it it's never referring to angels. That's what he's telling you, okay? Just so you know, do you know who didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead or angels? The Sadducees. This guy is a Sadducees. And you know what Jesus said to the Sadducees? He says, you err not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. They interpreted things exactly the way he's interpreting them, okay? Now, he's telling you, Jesus isn't coming. I want you to hear what he's saying. Jesus isn't coming in the future. Don't look for it. It's not coming. Okay? Jesus says, watch that you be counted worthy to escape these things. This guy's saying, don't look. Don't look. You're a fool if you look. The atheist will laugh at you, and the atheist won't want to believe in Jesus. People here sometimes will see this is the rapture, is gathering up into heaven. But it's not a vertical gathering. That's the word there, gathering, is sunagoge, which is where we get the, 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 the word today, synagogue. So they gather together. People think that that's going to be gathering to heaven, like that's the rapture. But it's not a vertical gathering, taking us to heaven. It's a horizontal gathering. It's gathering all God's children together. To give you an idea, let's go to John eleven forty seven and just read what's happening there. So here's another lie he's telling you. He's saying, uh, you know, that word just means synagogue. It just means synagogue. It just means a gathering for church, okay? No, no, no. Paul tells you what this word means. He says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, our gathering unto him, okay? Remember how he says synagogue? Epi synagogue, to him. This is our gathering together upon him. This is not going to church. This is, this is not going to church. He already described this. Listen, that's the second letter to the Thessalonians right after this letter where he says very clearly what's going to happen. The Lord himself will descend to heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What's that? It's the resurrection of the dead. And we who are alive will be caught up, harpazot. Remember, he sent up his angels to gather his elect with him in the clouds. Remember, he's going to be in the heavens, in the sky, to meet the Lord in the air. In the air. Let's see these words he uses. To meet the Lord in the air. Okay? Well, the air is, is a way to look at the... Um, physical air. So we know it's not outer space. We know it's not the third heaven. It's in the air, okay? And so should we shall be with the Lord. So there you go. Notice he says, the Lord himself shall de descend from heaven. Descend from Oranos. Heaven. And we're going to meet him in the air. Just so, you're, just so you don't think he's talking about outer space or the third heaven. It's the air. He uses both. 
He uses Oranos, and he uses the air. Yeah, in the clouds. You know, like lightning goes in the clouds, in the sky, in the air. It's literally things that's going to happen, okay? And he's telling you this. Look at Those who remain to the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord. Uh, they're all going to get destroyed in Jerusalem. They're going to have to flee to the mountains. Is that what he says? No. He says, us who are alive remain will be caught up together with him. Do you, do you see how he's twisting everything that's said in the scripture? Notice he, how he's not touching on these passages, which are the clearest descriptive passages of the things that he's reading in Matthew 24. He doesn't go to Daniel like Christ says. He doesn't go forward to Paul who read Daniel like Christ says. It says, in the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. This is in reference to Jesus. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If you let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. That's the gathering that he did, bringing all of God's children together. He will gather together his elect, his chosen. That word elect is just the Greek word chosen. His chosen, one into heaven to the other. Jews and the Gentiles. Notice how he tries to make it about, oh, he's going to pick up all the Jews. No, it doesn't say he's going to pick up all the Jews. It says he's going to pick up his elect. His elect. Well, who is his elect? Well, the New Testament tells you the elect are all the believers in Christ. I'll tend to be separated from each other. Even, it was that way even after Jesus died. Uh, it says that Peter was sent to the Jews and Paul was sent to the Gentiles. They were even fighting, you know, at Acts, you remember, they were fighting about the widows being overlooked. The Jewish widows were being overlooked. The Greek widows were being overlooked. And let's look at the Luke, all of it, discourse. It's going to be away, so it's going to be destroyed. And I'm not what is that? You have the temple, the covenant, the priesthood, all those ceremonies and practices. Those are going to be destroyed. So that what not be shaken will remain. That's the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Okay, verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So this verse uh, is, some people want to make it be uh, that day no one knows, the day the heavens and the earth pass away. But that, I don't think the subject is changing at all. It's still all the same one block. And you can kind of tell by the next verse. Uh, verse 37 says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So the subject is still the coming of the Son of Man. And about that day or hour, you don't know. Jesus had told him, I've told you the signs leading up to it. I told you the things that are going to have to be in place. You're going to hear wars. You're going to hear rumors of wars. This and this and this. You're going to be persecuted. Uh, so you know what's kind of going to come, but you don't know about that exact day nor that exact hour. And that's the point of this, this deal. Okay, some people think, again, that there's a break. Uh, and after he says. Notice how he says, well, wait a minute. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then flee. Well, wait a minute. He just says right there that you won't know till the exact day. So how, you're not going to know, but when you see the armies, flee. See how those two things conflict with each other? Because one's talking about 70 AD and the other one's talking about the last days. You're not going to know when the rapture happens. Okay? It's going to happen suddenly. And unless you're watching for the signs he told you to watch for, you're going to be taken like a thief. That's what he's saying. And when he's saying taken like a thief, he doesn't mean raptured. See, these guys misinterpreted this from this thief in a night video he watched when he was a kid. And they think raptured means taken like a thief in the night. But when Jesus uses the term thief in the night, just go look up in your Bible the term thief in the night. Just type in like a thief, okay? You're going to see it in uh, 1 Thessalonians. He said, the, Lord, the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. When they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them like travail upon a woman with a child. Boy, that sounds just like Matthew 24. But you and you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you like a thief. Why? Because we're watching for the signs. We're listening to Jesus. This guy is going to be taken like a thief because he refuses to listen to Jesus. Um, heavens and earth will pass away, my words will never pass away. The rest of it is talking about the day the heavens and the earth pass away. Um, one of the other reasons why you can see that's not the case, they would agree with me that before this verse is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, but after this is talking about the destruction of heavens and the earth on the last day in the future. Um, but if you turn to Luke, in Luke 17, Luke 17 is like a mini Olivet Discourse. It covers the same things and some details, but just a, a smaller summary. And you'll notice something interesting if you look at it. If you look in verse 26, it says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the, in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and be given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. So this is just like it has in Matthew 30, 24, 36, and 37. But after this... The reason Luke 17 says that is because just like the people went into Noah's ark and then the destruction came, we're going to go into the new Jerusalem and then the destruction is going to come. 
The new Jerusalem is literally going to be there, and we're going to be caught up into it. That's why Jesus says in John 14, My father's house has many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, and when I come, I will paralambano you. I will gather you to me. Okay? He says that in John 14, and it's the same word that is um, set for the angels to gather together as a luck. It's paralambano them. Okay? If you scroll down a little bit, um, in verse 30, it says, It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let no one who is in the housetop with his possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Um, then we have the two women of the grinding grain. One we Notice how he says it's the day that the Son of Man is revealed, but nobody sees it. What does revealed mean to you? They, they literally keep calling it the day of the Lord's appearing, the day he is revealed, the day of his appearing. It's epiphania. It's he literally appears. Well, appearing means nobody sees him, and somebody comes up with a speculation 1,800 years later. Taking one on the left. So they're in a different order now. That part about Noah is happening before it says, don't go back down off your roof and get things out of your house or come back down out of the field. So it's clearly talking about the same day, and since it reverses the order, that shows that very nicely. Let's go, let's go to verse 38 in Matthew. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be, women will be grinding grain with a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. A lot of times people say, in the days of Noah. So as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the second coming, where it's going to be super evil, the whole world is in terrible shape. But if you look at the context here, that's not what it's saying at all. It's not describing how bad it's going to be before the rapture. It's talking about normal things. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. That's just normal everyday stuff. That's not evil. It's not evil to eat and drink or to marry or give in marriage. It says, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That's what it's supposed to talk about. It's talking about the suddenness. People were just doing regular, ordinary things, then all of a sudden the flood came and took them all away. That's how it's going to be at the Son of Man. Then he says, two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding grain with a hand mill. One will be taken, and the other left. When's the last time any women were been grinding grain with a hand mill? That's clearly talking about times past. This is how myopic and dumb this guy is. Women don't grind with a hand mill anymore. Really? Do you, what do you think? They just added color to these pictures from 100 years ago? These are women all over India, all over the Middle East, poor countries that don't shop at Walmart. Women still grind in hand mills. Look at These are women grinding bread. It happens literally in like 60% of the world still does this. Okay, all over Africa, all over the Middle East, all over Central and South Asia, women grind at the mills. Okay, well, in America, we don't grind at the mills anymore. Actually, we do, but they're, they're automatic mills because we're rich. But people who aren't rich and who can't just go to Walmart and buy a bread, loaf of bread for six bucks, because literally six bucks is what they make in a month, they actually grind their own bread can't get over how stupid this guy is. Past. You know, we don't do that. Man, two men in the field, working in the field, again, not to happen. And I was told all my life that these two verses, 41, two men in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two men are grinding, grinding grain, one will be taken, the other left. That's the rapture. One's going to be taken to heaven, and one's going to be left here. But if you think of the analogy of what's actually happening here, it says, the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and the flood came and took them all away. Until the flood came and took them all away, verse 39. Two men will be taken in the field, one will be taken, the other's left. The one that's taken is the one that's destroyed in the flood, and the one that's left is, all, is, is not. Okay, this guy, supposedly an expert in Greek, I cover this in my, in, in my series on, um, I'm, I'm going to clip it to the end of this video, okay, my mid-trib proofs, okay? There's two different words for taken in Noah. Those guys, that's Iro, which is taken up and out of the way, and the word paralambano means taken along with yourself. It's literally the same word that talks about Joseph taking Mary along to be his wife. Okay, this guy got on my channel and told me I'm so ignorant of Greek, I need to watch this video to educate myself. Okay, he doesn't know that there's a difference between Paralambano and Iro of all the Greek stuff he's telling you. See, this is what he's doing. He knows. He's read this in the Greek, I promise you. But he knows you haven't. See, he's out to deceive the simple. This is a liar talking, okay? He's out to teach you that the second coming of Christ has not come, okay? Nobody grinds at the mill anymore. What he wants you to do is sit in America, get fat and lazy, not watch for the sign of Christ coming, and be one of those people who's not watching when he comes. Now listen, listen, listen to some common sense here. The riots that led to 70 AD, do you know when they started? 62. 
62. Does that sound like people are just eating and drinking and marrying and getting, giving in marriage and going on like normal until all of the sudden Roman armies surrounded the city? Do you know how long it takes for a Roman army to surround a city? You would see it coming from a month away. But they didn't see it until the day they suddenly showed up and killed everybody overnight. Do you know how long it takes to besiege a city? A year. That's if you're good at it. That's if you have a big ass army. You don't just show up and be like all of a sudden come in and pillage the place. You have to starve these people out and it takes forever. Oh, it's going to come suddenly though and they're never going to see it coming. The worst kind of fools in the world are the people who are equal parts ignorant and dishonest. And this guy is both. He's equal parts liar and idiot. Put them together and you have a damnable fool. It also could be referring to those that were taken into slavery. 50,000 Jews were taken into slavery. Verse 42. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Who should keep watch? The disciples. Who are you telling to? Well, those guys who were there with him, listening to him, he's telling them, keep watch, because you're not going to know when it's going to be. Verse 43. Understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and not all his house been broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that, that servant is wicked and says to himself, My master is staying away a long time, and then he begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him to the place of the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing the teeth. Again, this is just more of the same. In the days before the flood, people were doing normal stuff, and they came and took them all. People were, some people were grinding grain, and it just took them away. Some were in the field, took them away. And this is the same lesson he's teaching us here. He's going to come in an hour when you don't expect it. He, it says that he's, the servant's doing his, his uh, he's told that how, in charge of his house, and he says he should be doing that when he comes back. Do you suppose he's wicked and says, my master is staying away a long time? Some people see that and they see a time reference. See, it says a long time, so it's not going to be for a long time. But who does he come back to? He doesn't come back to the great-great-grandchildren of the servants. He comes back to those same servants. And he, the master will come on a day he does not expect, and an hour he's not aware, he'll cut into pieces and assign him to place of the hypocrites. So he comes back to that same generation. And again, at the time Jesus is saying this, he's something like, something like 8032, somewhere in there. And Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD. So that's something like 40 years later. So that would have been a really long time. 40 years is a really long time. And they would have been, I'm sure, saying, Jesus said the temple is going to be destroyed, and here it isn't. And they went on doing normal things again. But then it did come. In fact, Revelation was written just a few years before that. Uh, some people put Revelation as being written in AD 100. But it certainly was not. That's a topic for another video. Um, but it's important to note that it says in Revelation these things which must soon take place. We can go into a whole thing on just Revelation. Maybe someday we'll do that. 100% of the church believed that Revelation was written in 95 AD under the reign of Domitian. You can find it in Jerome. You can find it in, um, in Hippolytus, in Irenaeus. You can find it all the way up to the 1850s. Philip Schaff, who is a preterist, even said it in the 1850s, and then he changed his opinion in the 1890s. Okay? This guy who's saying all the commentaries tell you, he just he's just banking on your ignorance, okay? If you listen to him, you are an idiot. Because you need to go fact check everything he says, because he he's lied a hundred times in this video. Just flat out lied to you. Okay? Everything else he's done is just confuse the issue to try to deceive you, okay? So you can see in chapter 25, it continues the whole theme again about the same thing, about the unexpected nature of it. He comes, so these are not new things. They've been around a long time, and yet we've been told all our life that we're waiting for a future coming where it's going to get real evil and real terrible, and it's going to be suffering and terrible. When I was a, when I was a kid, uh, my parents showed me the day and the hour. Uh, which is, or, no, not the Danny Hour, it's called The Thief in the Night. It's a movie called The Thief in the Night. And it scared me so much as a kid. They told me, this is what's going to happen. This is going to happen. And it scared me so much, my whole body broke out in hives. It's the only time it's ever happened in my entire life, just from fear. I was so scared. There's one scene where parents are getting decapitated and the kids have to watch and all this sort of thing. I thought, I don't want that to happen. I was, I was just young at the time. So this view is called the preterist view. Preterist means past. and it's See, I wish he had said that at the beginning. See, he said, I heard about this as a child and I wasn't saved. So I'm terrified of death because I don't have the Holy Spirit living in me. And I broke out in hives because I was so scared of death. And I've never gotten over that fear of death. And I would never die to my, for my faith. I can't even imagine a world where people have to work in the fields and grind their own bread. I can't imagine that world. I'm so fat and lazy. Okay? And when I, I saw a video about people getting their heads chopped off for their testimony of Christ, which is literally happening in the Middle East as we speak, I said, I don't want that to happen. And so I made up an eschatology. I decided to side with the eschatology that says, don't worry, Jesus isn't actually coming. The tribulation is actually happening. There's no one getting your heads chopped off. 
People aren't getting killed by people who look like this. Whole villages of Christians in Nigeria aren't getting kidnapped and murdered. Oh, we haven't had like a whole bunch of guys like lined up along the Red Sea and just killed on camera. This didn't happen. Don't worry because this is ISIS. Uh... All these guys didn't get their heads chopped off on camera. This is how willfully ignorant this guy is. This is oh, you know, I. I saw the Left Behind movie of people getting their heads chopped off for Jesus, and I was like, I don't like that, so I'm just going to be a preterist. I want you to hear what he's saying. See, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. He heard about the rapture, and he heard about being beheaded for Christ, and he said, that scares me. I don't like it. So I'm just going to just eisegete the Bible and isolated, eisegete away everything that makes me uncomfortable and say, that just happened to the Jews. Everything's going to be fine. I'm just going to eat at Walmart till the day I die, fat and happy. And Christ isn't coming. He's just not coming. That's what he's telling you. Christ isn't coming. And that all these things happened in the past. And it wasn't foretelling the end of the world. It was foretelling the end of the old covenant. The temple system, the priesthood, the animal sacrifice, all that stuff, Jesus paid for by his blood. He was our sacrifice. So we don't need those anymore. And the temple was fully destroyed in 70 AD, burned to the ground. And now that was the realization of that. When it talks about Jesus coming, it is talking about coming and destroying the, that temple. And a lot of verses, which you may not have ever really paid attention to before, uh, all of a sudden make a lot more sense. Let's just visit a couple of those here real fast. Matthew 10, go down to verse 23. He's talking about sending out the gospel to all the, the different nations. And he says, All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. I don't know what you do with this verse if you think it's in the future. This tells you that the Israel, he's sending them out two by two into the towns to bring the gospel. And he says, I tell you, you're not going to finish going through Israel before the Son of Man comes, which is interesting. But with this view, that's exactly right. That's what was happening in Acts and in, in, in Romans and the Pauline epistles. They're going through the different churches. They're going through different places, bringing the gospel all around. And he says, you're not even going to finish going through all the cities before the Son of Man comes. Let's go to Matthew 16. Let's go down to verse 20. He's like, don't worry. The nations will only hate you until Jesus comes after all. Nobody's grinding flour today. Nobody grinds flour anymore. And this getting your heads chopped off for Jesus stuff, this doesn't happen. Not in my world. Where do you live? Uh, probably where the Predators live in Pennsylvania or something like that. Where they're literally in the countryside of Pennsylvania and they think the whole world is just like, you know, grocery stores and farmhouses and middle class incomes and everything like that. 27. You think they don't, the, the, the futurists, we call futurists people that, uh, that think that it's all in the future, that the end of the world is coming in the future. That's a futurist. Preterist means past, futurist is futurist. Futurists don't know what to do with this, this one. Let's go to 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each man according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. It's like, what? If you believe it's still future, then it says here, it says some standing here, some of the disciples who he was talking to, were not going to taste death before they see this happening. Before so here's his big challenge. Futurists don't know how to answer this question. Actually, we do. See, when he says some, all he means is it, at least one, okay? So let me show you an example of that because he likes to get into the Greek and he likes to get in other texts a little bit. See, in John 6, when all, the, all his disciples part from, depart from him and there's only 12 left, he literally says, um, Many of his disciples, when they heard this, he said they said they they left and they said they offends you, it offends him, and then he says, but then there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray, betray him. Therefore, he said that none, uh, no man can come to me unless it were given him by the Father. Now see, now he said, and Jesus has said, I have chosen one of you, and one of you is a devil, and he spoke of Simon Iscariot. Okay, so he's just talking about one person, Judas. Okay. And he says, some of you believe not. Some of you who believe not, okay? Notice he's just saying to his disciples. He's just saying to his, his 12 disciples who are left. Everybody else is left. And he said to them, some of you do not believe. Some of you do not believe. And yet he's just talking about Judas, okay? So, notice he said, some standing here will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So remember what my precedent is? John 6. And literally... John was there, and he records him saying, some of you do not believe, and not talking about Jesus. Well, that same John, he's going to be on the island of Patmos, and guess what he's going to see? Island of Patmos, and what did I see? He gave record to the word of God and the testament of everything he saw. And he says, behold, he comes in the clouds, and every eye will see him. And he's going to see Jesus coming in his kingdom. Okay. Notice he didn't say, you're going to be here when Jesus comes in his kingdom. He says, you're going to see Jesus coming in his kingdom.
okay? And he sees Jesus coming in his kingdom, and he writes down what he saw. He sees the kingdom. He sees Jesus coming in his kingdom. Because when you get to Revelation 11, he's going to say, O Lord God Almighty, which are in was in was to come, because you have taken thee thy great power and has reigned, and the nations have were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time for the dead, they should be judged. All this stuff he says. Your kingdom has come. He sees him coming in his kingdom. It's fulfilled. But this guy, because he doesn't listen to any futurist, he says, oh, no futurist can answer this question. Well, I'm a futurist, and I just answered your freaking question. Come on my channel and tell me I'm ignorant. It can't be the transfiguration because nobody was dead at that time. Jesus seems to be saying it's a time far enough in the future that most of you guys will be dead, but not so far there in the future that all of you will be dead. Some of you will still be left alive. And that's exactly what happened. If like 40 years later, many of them were killed, but John at least was alive to see it. And, and just so he doesn't see it, John, who was alive in 70 AD, was the one who saw Jesus coming in his kingdom in the Revelation. Okay? He didn't see Jesus come. His, his kingdom didn't come in 70 AD. No commentator in history has said Jesus' kingdom came in 70 AD. That's absurd. Why would you think his kingdom comes in 70 AD when he destroys Jerusalem? How does that make his kingdom come? Even those people who understand that there's multiple tenses of kingdom and some of them are spiritual knows that his kingdom, he already says, for the law and the prophets were unto John and now the kingdom of heaven is preached. And then he says when he sends out his disciples, tell them the kingdom has come near you. See? The kingdom's already come. But then when they see Jesus coming in his kingdom or they say you see the kingdom coming in power, all those things have different tenses to them. John's going to see Jesus coming in his kingdom. The other guys are going to see the kingdom coming in power. That's when, going to be when he pours out the Holy Spirit. And John's going to see Jesus actually physically, physically come in the Revelation. There's lots of these. If you read the Bible with that in mind, it starts coming alive a lot more. Let's just leave one more. John 21, the end of John, in verse 20. It says, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, following them. This is the one who had leaned back against the Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus it wasn't about the end of the world. Now I want you to listen to this. This guy is a deceiver. He is telling you Jesus Christ isn't coming. He's saying all the passages about Christ's second coming aren't describing his coming. They're only describing 70 AD, which means he's telling you there are no passages that describe Christ coming again to raise the dead. That's what he's telling you. Okay? Now, that's a true heretic. Every denomination of Christianity will say, that's a heretic. Theological triage and all your BS about we're all brothers in Christ, that's a true heretic. He is denying all the passages to describe Christ's second coming and the resurrection of the dead. Okay. Now, Paul says this. Listen, he's saying this. The, the gospel which I preached to you, he's saying, which you have received and wherein you stand, by which you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Now, what did Paul preach to these guys? Now, he says this, but he also describes first, first and Second Thessalonians were written to a church that he only taught for three weeks. And he tells them in Second Thessalonians, remember that I was with you. I told you these things. So that was the gospel he preached. And he's saying, if you don't believe it, if you don't keep in memory what he preached to you, then you've died in vain. And he's going to go on to tell you. That if it be preached that Christ rose from the dead, how are some of you that say there's no resurrection from the dead? This guy's denying the resurrection of the dead. If he's not, what passage are you going on? Because you're denying all of them are about 70 AD. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. That's what he's saying. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. And we are found to be false witnesses of God because we testify that God raised up Christ from the dead, who he raised not up if the dead don't rise. He said, if the dead rise not, then Christ is not raised. Okay, You need to get Paul's logic in your head. If you don't believe in the future resurrection of you, then you don't believe in the resurrection of Christ, he says. And he says, if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and you are yet dead in your sins. Okay, He's going to say, I believe Christ doesn't rise, but I'm a Sadducee, and I don't believe that anyone else is going to rise. Well, Christ just gave you a whole bunch of passages about the resurrection of the dead. Paul gives them to you, Daniel gives them to you, Christ gives them to you, and you're saying they're all about 70 AD. Okay, If you deny the resurrection of the dead, which is literally has to be based on something Christ said, you can't just pull some random verse and say, oh, Christ said he is the resurrection of the dead. 
And even the people back then, they said, we know that he's, we're, they're going to rise in the last day. They knew what he was talking about. You need to read First and Second Thessalonians. You need to read what they say, and you need to take it literally. Then you need to read First Corinthians 15, and you need to realize those are there so you don't get deceived. Okay, I'm talking to you preterists, okay? If you are born again, and you are a preterist, the only way you're going to get saved, if you're not watching for Christ's coming, is getting your head chopped off. This guy is telling you that this isn't happening. He said he doesn't want to believe in people getting their heads chopped off. He's saying this doesn't happen. Uh, it does happen. It still happens today. Okay. And he's like, I saw a video about that. Oh, there's no women grinding at the mill. There's no people getting their heads chopped off. None of that stuff is happening. Everything that makes me uncomfortable, I just wish it away. Well, I'm sorry, Care Bear Stare, but that doesn't work in real life. All right. You need to submit to what the scriptures say or you don't belong to Christ. And anyone who can spend this much energy twisting everything that Christ says, and then when Christ just flat out says, go read Daniel so that you understand what the abomination of desolation is, and he doesn't even attempt to do that, this is a man who says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Look at his comments. He's had this up here for five years. He told me to go watch this and educate myself. Okay, and when I tried to give him passages that he didn't understand and early church fathers that he didn't understand, he refused to look at any of them. He didn't even acknowledge any of them. Okay, he jumped on my channel and he tried to put some stuff on my channel that said, um, that literally took the words these things and said, this is the words that he uses in Matthew 24 for this generation to try to claim that everything I said about Jesus using hotus is false. Okay, I deleted this comment after like seven warnings saying, listen, I'm not going to let you put deceptive stuff in my comment section. He flat out lied. When I called him on it, he didn't change his comment. He just wanted to, he, he wants to catch low-hanging fruit, which are the, look at this guy has 5,000 subs. He's deceiving 5,000 people into not being ready when Christ comes. He's deceiving them into not even believing Christ is coming. Okay? Now listen. Listen to what Second Peter says, okay? Now Second Peter is literally talking about the same kinds of people that deceived the Jews in 70 AD, okay? He, he, he calls them false prophets who will bring in damnable heresies, denying the Lord that bought them, okay? Now, what are they going to say? He said they're going to promise them liberty while they themselves are slave to corruption, okay? After they have escaped the pollutions of this world and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, they are again entangled therein and overcome, and the latter end is worse than the first. Now, I looked at this guy's channel. He's telling you Christians go out and celebrate Halloween, so spiritual. There's nothing wrong with Halloween. There's nothing satanic about it. It's literally the witch's Sabbath. It's the day of the, 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 the day after Halloween is the day of the dead in, in Catholic ceremony. It's a pagan holiday, but it openly celebrates with witchcraft and ghouls and goblins and all this stuff. Oh, I've never seen that. Well, you've never seen women grinding at the mill either. It's happening, okay? I've never seen a witchcraft witch world where they're sacrificing babies, so therefore it doesn't happen anywhere. Now listen to what he says. He's telling you to stir, stir this up, okay? Remember, he's telling you about these false prophets who are coming, bringing damnable heresies. Now listen. He says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking at their own, after their own lust. I care more about what the atheist says and what the Sibylline oracles say and what the Sadducee Josephus says than what Jesus says, okay? I care more about celebrating Halloween than I care about being prepared for the Lord's coming. That's who you're dealing with, Okay? And he says, where is the promise of his coming? For since the father fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's what he's saying. It's always been like this. People try to predict it and they're always wrong. Okay? For this they are willingly ignorant of. For the word of God of, of heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, whereby the earth that was was being overflowed by water perished. See, the world was destroyed by water. And then he said, But the heavens of the earth which are now by the same word kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. I'm telling you, these guys don't believe the earth is going to be destroyed by fire. I've listened to them talk. They don't believe that. They say, no, that's just a metaphor. God's going to restore it. Listen to what Peter says. But beloved, be not ignorant of this thing. They're going to say, he says soon. He says soon. It's near. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that a, one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. When God says th soon, he might mean a thousand years or two thousand years. And there's a prophecy in Hosea that says two days after Jesus goes back to his place, He's going to return, and the Jews are going to return to him. 
two days, 2,000 years, okay? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, that all, but all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Remember what I told you this guy's not prepared for? I watched a movie called A Thief in the Night, and I was scared, and I decided I don't want this. That's what he's saying. I heard about what's coming, and I don't want it. Okay? The Lord will come as a thief of the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Now, he's talking about what happens at the beginning and the end of a thousand-year day, okay? He comes like a thief at Armageddon, and then it says that the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth and the works therein shall be burned up, okay? Now, listen, he says he comes like a thief in the night, okay? You read in the book of Revelation, this is not 70 AD. I want you to listen to this. Revelation 15 16. Now listen, he says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walks naked and they see his shame. Okay? He says, You need to watch. You need to be looking for the signs that Jesus commanded you to look for. Now listen to what he says to Revelation in Revelation chapter 3. He says, To the angel of the church of Sardis, he says, These things says him who says the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, and I know your works that you have a name that you live, but you're dead. Okay? I want you to listen to what the Bible is saying about guys like this. It's saying, you have a name that says you're alive, or you're going to call yourself a Christian, okay? But you're dead in your sins, okay? He says, you have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. And he says, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain and are ready to die, for I have not found your works to be perfect before God. I don't care about your YouTube videos and how many people you reach, and you're reaching them with lies, okay? He said, remember therefore how you have received and repent and hold fast. Therefore, if therefore you should not watch. Remember what Jesus says, watch, watch. He's going to say it again and again. You watch for the signs of his coming. <clears throat> we are to always be looking for Christ's coming according to the signs that he gave us, okay? It's not about date setting. It's about listening for what he said is going to come. And he said, when you see the abomination of desolation, that's what we're watching for, okay? And he says, if you don't watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and you shall not know what hour I come upon you. And then he says at Armageddon, I come like a thief. That's Armageddon, that's not 70 AD. Now listen to this. This was written 20 years after 70 AD. And he's telling you it was written before 70 AD. You don't need to watch. Nothing that Jesus commands here to the churches is relevant for you. I want you to hear that. He's saying all this stuff he's saying to watch for is not relevant for you. What he's telling you to do is go back to sleep, be as ignorant as I am, and trust me because I know Greek. And he's telling you to be deceived. Okay? Don't listen to this guy. You need to shut him off. You need to shut him out. If he comes to you and criticizes you, you give him a warning. You say, you read, listen, listen to this. <laughs> I'm not the first person who's told this guy this. Three years ago, this guy said, how, how do you view 2 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 with this point of view? No response. Why no response? He's not going to give you a response if you, don't, if, you don't, if you answer, give him a question he won't answer. I gave him like five questions. He wouldn't answer one of them. He just kept accusing me of being ignorant. Okay? This is a deceiver. This is a snake. And don't be deceived by people who sound nice. That's the problem. They sound nice and you think they're believable because of that. Don't be like that. Compare what they said to what Jesus said. Remember, Paul rebuked Peter to his face and he loved Peter and he loved Jesus. Okay? He yelled at people and called them fools because he loved them and he didn't want them to be fooled. Don't be a fool, you fool. Listen. Don't just don't be deceived by this crap, okay? If you're, if you're a preterist or you're leaning towards preterist, you need to know you are in a full-blown heresy, okay? This is not a difference of opinion. This is not an error. This is a heresy. These guys are saying, we have the true interpretation, and you're a fool if you watch for the signs of the coming of Christ that he told you to watch for. They're telling you, don't listen to Christ. Listen to me. That's called deception. Batman out. Peace. Peace, I'm out. I'm Batman.